as we bow Cause you are here You are here So come away As we bow down So you are here So you are here And have your, have your way as we as we bow down, you are Lord, you are you have your as we bow so you are here so you are here you'll have your way have your way so as we bow because you are Yes, you are. So you have your as we bow. Lord, you are here. Yes, you are here. We say, have your way. Lord, as we bow. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Lord, have your as we take control here and now, take control here and now, so take control. Lord, take control.
敬仰，为仰，为仰，为仰，仰为若能看空白昼。To receive. We are here waiting, O Lord. We thank you, mighty God, for another time in your presence. We thank you, mighty God, that we are a chosen generation, that we are called after your own, O Lord. We thank you, mighty God, for everybody who will be coming this morning to speak to minister. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will be with us in this auditorium. We ask that you will be with us wherever we are. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your power, your presence, and your might. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. Amen. Thank you, Father. Welcome to day two, everybody. Welcome to day two. All right. I hope that we are all well rested and that we have. Why we can go? Thank you, Father. 
Um, I hope that we're all well rested and that you've enjoyed your evening. Um, today is going to be a wonderful day. We've got so a lot of teaching sessions. <coughs> We've got a lot of teaching sessions happening. Um, and and I believe that my first speaker is um, getting ready. So you can all have your seats in the auditorium. So this morning um, we are having some. Our first session is some career-based sessions. And I know as students, as people who are in the early stages of their career, that this will be very um, beneficial. Our next speakers are two graduates of University of Nottingham and Nottingham Trent University, doing very, very well in their careers. And um, I hope that you guys have your notebooks ready and your pen to take some really good notes. Um, throughout the session as well, if you have a question, we have a link on Slido um, that will be flashing across the screen. So please, please, please share your questions um, throughout the session. As you can see, it's on the screen now. And I would like to welcome to the stage Toppe and Charmaine. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Multimedia at live.com. Sorry about this, guys. As I send this, I will just introduce myself. For now. Okay, um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's Topper. I, um, my age doesn't matter. Um, I'm a graduate from the University of Nottingham. Um, I studied between the years of 2013 to 2016. Um, I did a postgrad, which was a PGCE in secondary mathematics which I finished in 2017. My undergrad was in economics and econometrics. Um, I grew up in North London. Woo. Woo, yes, finally, North London people, we're never around. So have you guys received the slides yet? Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, I grew up in North London, went to school in Northwest London, Camden area. Um, a-levels, I'm just giving you a little bit of my academic background so that this will make sense as we go through. A-levels were in mathematics, economics, and theology and philosophy or religious studies, whatever you called it in your school. Um, and again, for a bit of context, I'm dyslexic. So the title of this session is, Is It Too Late to Turn Things Around? And this is about academic study, um, I guess, pursuing success, pursuing excellence at the end of your academic journey. And it's called, is it too late to turn things around? Because, well, you know, everyone's journey will be different. Um, but for some people, you will need a lot of turning around <laughs> in order to, to get the grade that you desire. So if you can go to the next slide for me. Yeah, so that's the summary I've just given you about myself. Fantastic, lovely. The next slide. So as I said, loads of people have very different academic journeys. So I've tried. I love maths, I'm a mathematician, so I love graphs. So I've tried to kind of present it to you in this way. Um, so the first one, you probably have people who just consistently are consistent. They either do really well all the time or they don't do really well all the time. They're excellent all the time, first class all the time or tutu all the time or fail everything all the time. That would be your push in Jesus' name. Um, <laughs> the second one, people who start really well. This is, I'm talking about your university journey here. There's people who start really well and gradually, for whatever reason, some people, personal, family reasons, things on the outside that affect it, or just motivation and whatnot, it just goes downhill from there. You've got the people who start okay, 
start doing really, really well and then all of a sudden drop off. People who start really well gets a bit fuzzy in the middle and then end really well. People who don't start great at all end fantastically. And then the people who are quite average throughout and then at the end are able to do really well. Obviously, these are not the only types of academic journeys you can have. I mean, some people have glitches along the way. So some people have to do retakes, transfers to another university. Some people have to restart university altogether. Mm -hmm. Some people decide that university is not even for them and just drop out completely and decide to do something else. Yeah? So for me, my academic journey was much like the fourth picture. So I started really, really well. Came to university. So, I mean, throughout school, I was quite... Oh, I thought you were saying something to me. Throughout school, I was quite... Um, I'm not going to use the word lazy. I was motivationally challenged <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a secondary school girl. And obviously, with subjects like maths and science and whatnot, they, they came to me quite naturally, so I didn't put much effort in for them. Subjects like English and whatnot, though, I, I struggled a lot. Again, you saw that probably because I was dyslexic. At the time, I didn't know because my mum refused to let, them, let me do the assessment. So I didn't actually get diagnosed officially with dyslexia until I was in university, and I went by myself. Um, so yeah, my first year of university, I found quite straightforward. I found that all the techniques for revision and everything that I did at, at A-levels and, and GCSE, it worked for me. Um, I was quite balanced in terms of my social life, in terms of things that I got involved with, in terms of my academics. Um, also, I had a lot of drive in my first year. You know, you first come to university, like, I have to do well. I'm paying 9,000 plus a year. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to take it for granted. Again, everyone's looking at me. Not everyone felt that way, but... That was my journey. Then my second year, I just fell off completely. Not because I wasn't trying to do well. And I say fell off, that's the wrong term because I didn't actually fall off. So I ended, I ended my first year with a first class. I ended my second year with a, a very low 2-2 two -two, as in borderline third. Um, which again, and if anybody knows, that, that's still difficult to get because it still requires a lot of hard work. Um, but for me, it wasn't a display of academic excellence. That was just, that's just the reality of it. Um, I committed to too many things, both, I'm going to be honest here, and maybe p is going to catch me outside afterwards, but I committed to a lot of church stuff, a lot of RY stuff, um, but then a lot of uh, um, career-related stuff. I was doing the most. I was doing a lot of things. I was also um, doing a small side hustle that no one really knew about because my parents couldn't afford to pay towards my accommodation or give me much spending money or anything like that. So I was having to make money where I could. Um, I had an over-reliance on old study techniques that just weren't working. Second year content is just mad for some reason. I don't know. It's like a massive jump between first year and second year. Look, thank you. Everyone feels that. I'm glad it's not just me. A lot of people feel that way about second year. It just hits you. And also it's the first year at uni or for my course at least, I know it's different for different people, but it was the first year that counted. So maybe the pressure got a lot. But yeah, I was very career focused and I think I put a lot of time into applying for internships and stuff, which we'll talk about after. Um, but it took my attention away from my academics. And then as I mentioned, I was um, diagnosed with dyslexia and for a minute I let it get me down because I was so focused on the fact that I've always known I can't do this thing and now they've told me I can't do it, so I know I can't do it, rather than trying to change that. <laughs> And also, I failed a core module, um, a core module that they would not let me reset. So, you know, normally if they let you reset, reset it, they at least cap it. Uh, they said you can't even reset it. So that's that. Let me tell you, it was a 26 I got on that module. I walked into the exam and I froze completely. I revised, I froze, and I barely wrote anything. I don't even know how I got 26. So in my third year, my third year was the turnaround point. It was the easiest year of my academic journey, honestly. It was the best year of my academic life, had a great social life. I had the balance right in terms of what I was involved with in church, RY, etc. Um, and my studies were just going well. Things were just going well for me. And I finished with a first class. So I managed to turn around from a low 2-2, borderline third, to graduate with a first class degree. Um, so, <laughs> um, now I'm not telling you that to brag because really it's partly useless to me now. Once you start getting some career experience, you realise that your academics obviously become less and less important, but it is, it is great for getting your foot in the door. So I'm not saying it's not important, it absolutely is. But then once you start building your academic experience and your CV gets longer, they start to look less and less 
at the academic part. But what I want to do is share some of the keys that I found helped me from my perspective in terms of turning things around. Um, and obviously there's, there's loads of other options that just like I mentioned, some people will just start a new course. Some people have just realized that the course they're doing is just not right for them. And they're in their first year or even second year. Some people I know, third year, and they've just said, you know what, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I know I don't want to do this. I know I want to change. But for others, if you're like me, you did enjoy the topic, you were interested, you just struggled a little bit and you just wanted to get to the end. You just wanted to get there to the end. So next slide, please. So I've kind of split it into two parts. So I'm going to speak about the you factor and the God factor. Again, this is all personal and there are other things that, could add, that you could add to this list and there's some things for you that you know won't work and you'll take away from this list. But this is what worked for me. So the first thing on the you factor is um, to reevaluate your commitments and priorities. So again, just like I said, people might catch me outside, but I think it is important that as a university student, you are really looking at what have I committed my time to? Should I be committing this much of my time to these things? Am I prioritizing my academics? Now you guys have come here, whether your parents push you out the door here, whether you decided to come here on your own, you've come here to get a degree and you've got to leave with a degree, yeah? Everything else that they talk about in terms of university, the social life, et cetera, et cetera, those are all benefits, those are all byproducts, those are all things that you enjoy as a result of being here. However, the, you, the fact that you came for a degree means you must leave with a degree. And us as a church, we are committed to not just your spiritual life, but we're committed to you as a whole person. So this is important to us. And I'm gonna say this now, Oh, people can read. <laughs> I'm going to say this now, but if you ever, ever feel like we are not prioritizing your academics, I'm going to say this as me as a leader myself, that I want you to pull me up on it. And I'm sure that other leaders will agree with me that if you ever, ever feel that we are not prioritizing your academics, that you should pull us up on it because it's important to us. So looking at your commitments, what have I committed myself to? Are these things that I really have time for? And this is as an individual. Now, other people will say, and I know there are, there was a babe called Hannah who everyone will know if you knew Hannah when you were here, an amazing president of Trentside. She was, to me, she's one of my friends now. She's a superhuman person. She did so many things and she still graduated with a 2-1, but she was all about the place. But I know that I don't have the capacity in certain areas that Hannah had. And that's just me as an individual reevaluating what I've committed myself to and knowing, can I, can I do these things? Maybe not. Some areas I can, I can push myself, but other areas I might not be be able to. So thinking about that, also things you're doing now, I'm not just talking about church stuff now, in terms of your social life, in terms of other things you've committed to, is there something that you're always traveling to London for? Can you hold that up? Can you hold up to that? Can you really travel to London or Birmingham, wherever you are, you're from every week and still keep up with your academics? Things like that. Look at your strengths and your weaknesses. So um, one example is for me, when I'm studying, I, I used to study in my room, and I could only study in my room. I couldn't study in the library a lot of the time because it was very distracting having other people around. The only time I could do work in the library is if I was doing coursework. But in terms of revision for exams, I had to be in my room, on my bed, my papers laid out. Now, I know for a lot of other people, they cannot do that because they will sleep. For me, that's the only way I could revise. So know yourself, know your strengths and weaknesses. Can I, do I revise at home? If I don't revise at home, why am I still at home when it's time to revise? Get up and go to the library, things like that. Um, so knowing your capacity, being honest with yourself, self-reflecting. Now, another thing is um, diligence. Now, this word comes up a lot. Um, and the definition I have here for diligence is constant and earnest effort to accomplish what is undertaken, persistent exertion of body or mind. Um, now, diligence, to me, comes in three parts. So for me, for diligence, I think it's in the next slide. You guys, the next slide for me? No? That's fine. Thank you. Um, consistency, instancy, and accuracy. So, when we're talking about consistency, we're talking about doing things consistently. I mean, there's no other word I can really use for that. Um, when we talk about instancy, we're talking about now, we're talking about not procrastinating. I think on the next side, I have a, um, a quote that I found online. I saw it on Twitter once, and it really just like, yeah, turn me upside down. 
Procrastination is the arrogant assumption that God owes you another chance to do tomorrow what he gave you the chance to do today. And I was just like, oh, okay, God, please, like, forgive me <laughs> for ever thinking that I have any opportunity in the world to do something when I have a chance to do it now. That's laying around for 30 minutes. That's even small. Five hours scrolling through TikTok. And then the next day, realizing that you only have <laughs> however, however long to complete an assignment that you could have started the day before. And I'm saying that as a person who has always been a last minute person, who procrastinates and holds, holds things to the last minute. That's the kind of habits that you have to nip in the bud. So if we go back again to the last slide, accuracy was the last part of diligence there. Um, accuracy is about doing things right, doing things well. Right? We can, there's no point doing assignments if you're not going to put your all into and do it well and get it right. Yeah, so producing high quality work. So back to the previous slide again. Um, planning, setting targets and goals. Um, widening the pool of resources that you use. So that's about utilising what's around you. So we're talking about other people in your class. Don't just stick to the people that you know. I found that in my final year of university, one of the things that helped me over the line is that I just started speaking to people in my lectures beyond my friends. I was like, wow, these people actually have brain? Well, duh, that's why they're studying this course and that's why they're doing well. And I found that with certain coursework or exams, it's like I didn't know what I was doing. My friends didn't know what they were doing. And I was just like, you know what, let me message this random person on the course who seems to always know what they're doing. Voila, they know what they're doing and they're helping me out. Do you get what I mean? So utilising those people, utilising your lecturers. One thing I find is that people pay so much for university and there's some people who have never ever, who don't even know where their lecturer's office is or like have never emailed, I'm looking, and some people are doing, oh yeah, mm, and never emailed their lecturer before. Let me tell you one testimony from my um, final exam season. I did this module which was in a completely different school from mine, so it was in the business school at Uni of, called Law and Economics because everyone had raved about how easy the module was, it, the older people had raved about how easy the modules were. I went to revise for it, and I honestly, it's like the words were jumping out of the page. I honestly could not understand a single thing. I'd gone to every single lecture, and I was just like, did he actually teach any of this? I don't remember any of this. And I remembered that this guy gave us his number in the first ever lecture, and I managed, honestly, like, this was God, that I opened the book, and his number was right there, and I just said, you know what? Let me um, message him. I texted him. He said, yeah, I'll call you in 10 minutes. So, oh, lovely. He called me and he told me exactly what was going to be on the exam. The people are doing, he, he said to me in, this, in these exact words, well, I can't exactly tell you what's going to be on the exam, but if I was you, these are the three things that I would look at. And I said, what? <laughs> All I had to do was, <laughs> was message the, the lecture. They want you to succeed. Let me tell you, I work in the University of Nottingham. And one thing we know is that it's important for the lecturers, for their students to do well. It reflects on them in terms of their performance indicators. They want you to do well. If you approach them, they will help you. And it's their job to help you. That's part of what you're paying for. So utilize your lecturers. Um, in terms of widening your pool of resources as well, do not just stick to the lecture notes. Now, I'm being a hypocrite because for most of the time, that's exactly what I did. I bought books and I never opened them. But if you know that you're not a reader, so you don't like books, use YouTube videos. That's what I did. I used a lot of YouTube videos, audio files, etc graphs, anything else that can help me to understand the content of what I was um, reading or looking at. Um, yeah, not being afraid to ask for help. So that's, besides just people at the university, friends, alumni who have done those degrees before. Um, and then I've put reevaluating your um, your motivations. So in terms of this, for, some, for a lot of you, you might be at university and you don't really know why you're at university. You, I mean, you don't want to be here. You feel like you were forced to be here. Maybe your parents forced you to come. Or maybe you just felt like in order to, you don't know what next to do in your life, so the next best thing is university because that's what everyone else does. An important thing here is if you're trying to end well, is to know what your motivations are. Um, and a big part of this as well, is pleasing God. And it sounds, people are like, what does God have to do with my academics? God has to do with everything in your life. Um, 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, so then whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, or the glory of our great God. And to me, like, it got to that point. I was like, you know what? I do all this other stuff for God. I sing in a choir. I do this, I do that. 
And like, I'm not taking my academics seriously. Is it because I don't think that God can be glorified in my academics? Like, wow. How can I succeed in everything else and then be a shame in the area such as my academics, where I should be a shining light, where I should be successful, where other people should be looking at me and say, wow, I can see God in her life. So that doesn't make any sense. So reevaluate your, your motivations. What exactly is it that's pushing you to do well in your academics? Now, I'm going to talk about the God factor. And if I'm very honest, all the first column is great. It's fantastic. And if you can do it, you'll do it. This is what everybody else is doing out there that's successful. They're being consistent. They're being diligent. They're self-reflecting. They're knowing their weaknesses. They're not committing to too many things. They're balancing their time really well. Now, this, the God factor was the changing point for me. The God factor, if I'm being honest, is what took me over the line from just getting a 2-1 to getting first class. So the first thing here is asking for an excellent spirit. Um, so Philippians 4, 6-7. Now, this was my anchor verse throughout university, especially through my second year when I, struck, when I started to struggle and into my third year. Um, so I didn't put it on the screen. But um, Philippians 4, 6-7, it says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. Now, I put every single thing in God's hands. I really learned how to utilize prayer. It was, to me, it, it became beyond just learning how to speak in tongues and just sitting there, just saying, OK, God, please protect me as I go out and come in. Like, it became a new level of interaction with God in terms of fellowship with him with the Holy Spirit and asking him to actually intervene in my academics. Asking for an excellent spirit like Daniel. I said, if I desire it, why can't God give it to me? Of course he can. Um, the next thing there is in, involving the Holy Spirit in your studies, um, who is the most supreme resource. So I say that because for me, just, I gave you one testimony about how I contacted one of my lecturers and he told me what was going to be in the exam. Fantastic. But there were cases where I, I didn't have that. And I kid you not, I knew exactly what was going to be in the exams, not just for, for doing guessing game and looking at past exams, but I truly believe that the Holy Spirit was opening my eyes to see. I'm sure it was even Eben. I don't know if you guys know Dr. Eben. She was giving a testimony about how she read like the smallest bit. One day, that Holy, she felt like the Holy Spirit was just telling her to read a, the smallest bit in one textbook, and it came up in the exam. It's like a big question. It's those kind of things, those promptings that the Holy Spirit will give you. Um, having faith. So faith is the confidence and what we hope for um, will, actually hap um, will actually happen. It gives us the assurance about things we cannot see. Um, and that's from Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, your level of faith, I believe, will truly carry you through. Let me tell you the level of faith I had. And people thought I was mad. My own sisters, my siblings thought I was mad. Bear in mind, they knew my academic ability. I finished, just as I told you, with a 2-2 in my second year, a very low 2-2, borderline third. I was applying for grad jobs, saying that I was put it to the first class, confidently without a thought. And people were like, what are you doing? What if you don't get a first class? I said, no, I'm getting a first class. That's the level of faith I had. I knew God was going to do it. I, I, I can't even tell you how, but I just knew. I was like, God is going to do this. How can I, how can I, saw the, I saw myself getting a first class when I started university. Not even as a joke or as a hope. I saw it. I know that that's what God wanted for me, for whatever reason. Not that it makes it any better or worse if I got a 2-2 two -two, or 2-1, two -two two but I knew that that's what I was going to get. So how can I not have the faith that, that God is going to carry that out? So I went in and I was applying for grad jobs with, um, with a tutu saying that I'm going to get it first. Um, and then um, the last thing I have there, which I want to touch on very briefly, is accepting your weaknesses and drawing strength from God. Um, so if you go to, can you go through to my slide, slide seven? No, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so let me be honest. Accepting your weakness is not the same thing as giving in to them, right? So it's about knowing where you're weak and submitting it to God, knowing the obstacles that are in front of you um, and that you're unable to tackle on your own and submitting it to God. So this, um, I remember sharing this with Abigail, actually, a couple of years ago. So just like I said, I'm dyslexic, blah, 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 all of that. Um, and in my second year, when I, when I was fully, properly diagnosed, I was like, oh, I knew it. And I kind of submitted to it, and I gave into it, and I was like, yeah, I'm dyslexic, I can't do this, I can't do that. Um, and then I came across this, and I believe it was probably in one of our RY sessions that our president, um, Demola at the time, read for some reason. I don't even think we were studying this, but he must have read it. Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 10 in the message version. 
Now, obviously, I've pulled it a little bit out of context, but in the way that I read it, it was very relevant to me. It says, because of the extravagance of those revelations, and so I wouldn't get big-headed, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angels did his best to get me down. What he did, what he in fact did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift. I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and then he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now I take limitations in stride. And with good cheer, these limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accidents, abuse, accidents, opposition, bad breaks. I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. And that, that hit me like bricks, honestly, because I was like, wow, like this weakness that I think I have in my academics. And for other people, it might be different things. It might be another learning difficulty. Or it might just be something else that is just, that is just, it might be finance. For some people, it's finance that is frustrating the academics. But I was just like, you know what, in that weakness, <laughs> In that weakness, that's where God comes in, and that's why my testimony, to me, it could be, it could be lousy to anybody else, but to me, that's why my testimony is so beautiful, because even in those weaknesses that I have, God has still shown himself to be strong. The last thing I have there that I'm just going to touch on, um, oh, I put it before that last point, but it was just about praying for a miracle, because sometimes that's just what you need. Sometimes, no matter how many calculations you do of your results that if I get 70 this and this and if I get it sometimes it never adds up it never adds up but I believe that in my journey things that I could never imagine but I prayed for because I was just like god you have to do something crazy here happen so for me um before previously our second year was worth 40 percent and our third year was worth 60 percent and I was like, if that's the case, me and my mathematics brain, I'm, there's no way I can get a first class. That doesn't make sense, God, because I know you showed me getting a first class degree. I walked into our first lecture in my second year, and they said, oh, okay, we've changed the rules now. We've now decided to reduce your second year to 30% and your third year to 70%. And I said, what? I immediately brought out my calculator, and I said, let me just, let me make sure this is adding up. And I figured out that, oh my gosh, if I actually, if I did what I needed to do, I could get a first class. Miracles like that, or... In one of my exams, I walked in and one of the questions was about a study that I definitely did not read, as in I didn't even set my eyes on that study. And I started to get flustered because I was like, this is a big part of the exam paper. And out of nowhere, a fire alarm went off <laughs> in the middle of the exam. I said, oh, thank you. Um, we walked outside and this is where I was like, okay, God, you're going to come through because somebody's going to start speaking about it and tell me the answer. All the students were talking, they were trying to stop people from talking, all the students were talking, but no one knew the answer, no one had read the paper. I said, oh, all this for nothing. <laughs> I went back into the exam hall and sat down and I just looked at the paper and out of nowhere, it's like words started to appear on my page and it's like Holy Spirit was telling me what this paper that I had never seen in my life was about. It was about twins, a study about twins and a controlled experiment. I, I knew nothing about this and to me that was a miracle that I would get that and write that down as if I knew exactly what was that paper in that exam and hit high, a high first class in that exam. So pray for a miracle, believe in a miracle. God is still in the business of doing miracles. Um, and then the last slide on that section, it says uh, the next one. Last one at least though, your worth is not dependent on how you do academically. And I know some of you are like, oh, doesn't that defeat the purpose of everything I said? No, it doesn't. God values you whether you get a first class or whether you get a 2-1 or whether you get a 2-2. Two -two. And then at the end of the day, as long as you apply yourself, you do well, you pray like you haven't revised and you revise like you haven't prayed, and you commit everything else in, to God's hand, then the result is, is going to take you to exactly where God needs you to go. And I'm just going to leave the academic section on that. Thank you. Hi guys, um, thank you Tope, that was actually inspirational even for me um, at this stage in my career. So, um, as Tope mentioned, we will be... Next slide please. Thank you. We'll be going into the next session, which we've called, Is it too early to start thinking about my career? Um, 
So just a bit of background about me. So my name is Charmaine, for those who don't know me. I am in my final year of my training contract. So I'm from a legal background. Um, I'm quite different to Tope in the sense that I came to uni, I knew what I wanted to do, and I had a plan. Um, and as some of you probably do have, we all have plans and we have an idea of how it'll go. And we think that's just the way it's got to work. Um, so the next slide. Okay, so um, the next slide talks about the different things that you can do. So, um, as I mentioned, I had a plan and I knew what I wanted to do. Um, I came into university. Ironically, my father didn't want me to study law, um, which is quite ironic because some people's parents, everyone that I knew at least, they were like, oh my God, my dad, my mum wanted me to do law. Um, my father was the opposite. He, he, we laugh about it now, but he said, this career is too hard. My child, I actually moved to the UK in 2010. So in fairness to him, I was coming into the UK from Africa um, and I was going to university in 2014. So I had four years to try and achieve everything I needed, something that some children have been doing for years and years and years and preparing for years to do. And I came and I said, I'm going to do law. And he was like, so even with my A-level choices, he was just a bit unsure because I was really good at sciences and maths wasn't my, <laughs> wasn't quite my, um, my niche, but I was really good at sciences. So he was always trying to push me towards that direction. And I was like, no, dad, I'm going to do English literature. I'm going to do history and I'm going to do psychology. And he was like, okay. Um, and after my first year of A-levels, I just didn't do well in English literature at all. Um, but thank God for my mum. She pushed me to get a, a tutor. Um, fast forward anyways to getting into university and as I say, I'm, I'm coming to do law and I had no idea where to start and I had no idea how I say behind I was. The topic being, is it too early? I came into uni thinking I, I'll come and there'll be a starter pack on what you should do and everyone will guide you. No, I think some of you who've probably been in uni for a couple of years now or are in your first year have noted that you come to uni and they almost just expect you to know what to do. Um, and I learned at the end of my first year that all my peers, which is why it's important to talk to your peers, were already planning vacation schemes, they were planning internships, they had applied because deadlines closed really early, and I was just sat there quite starstruck, like, oh, okay, I haven't done anything. Um, but this is why we've done this, this part. This part is really important because it's not too early to start thinking about your career. For the first years, there are insight days, information sessions, internships, employment events, career fairs, and those are so important. Even if it's the case that they might not cater to you as a first year, it's experience. And one thing I personally have learned about career and searching for jobs and assessment days and interviews, it is a skill. Everything is a skill. And for lack of, even if the opportunities are not necessarily catered to first years, you go there, you start planning, you start talking to people, you start learning how to interact, you start learning how to network, you start getting information. The insight days are really insightful because most times they send a, a, a student or they send one of their early trainees, you get an opportunity to speak to them. You get a head start, essentially. You know, talking to trainees, finding out how they managed to apply, when they started applying. Um, they start telling you things about what they offer, things that might not even be on the website. So I would say as a first year, you're probably in a very good position to start thinking about attending insight days, attending in, in, insight days, attending information sessions, internships and employment events. If you're in your penultimate year, in your second year, so as I said, I came with a plan and um, I was planning to do a three degree, graduate, get a training contract in my second year and be done with it. You know, I really had that idea that I'd do everything in five years and it would be perfect. And that's how it went. Um, I was really fortunate because I started, as I say, attending events in my first year, started talking to students who'd gone on placement. I don't know if you guys know, but they actually do legal placements, year-long legal placements, and that was something that I wasn't aware of. And initially I thought, do I really want to add another year? This is already a really long course. How do I do this? But with time, I, um, I just thought, you know, and, and as Topper said, prayer is so important. I, I can't express it enough. I think my prayer life really grew in university and thanks to RI as well because I was in um, 
the exec team and I was a prayer, uh, prayer leader. So it was almost like God placed me in that position to learn and grow in that area. So I prayed and prayed and prayed and I really didn't want to do a placement year. I didn't want to add another year to my journey. But, you know, well, thank God, I actually ended up, um, I was quite late to it. So they did tell me, unfortunately, you can't get, because what they do with university, I don't know if they do at universities, but at Trent, they have placement years as an option. So if you're on the course, they give priority to you for applications. So because I wasn't on the course, they basically told me, unfortunately, we have to let our students apply first. And then if they get rejected, you'll basically be able to apply. So everything was really last minute for me. But by God's grace, I managed to apply and I got onto a year long placement with Shoesmiths, which is a really good firm. Um, and so that was kind of a complete diversion into my degree as already. Things weren't going to plan. And I used to be, I say used to be because I'm definitely not like this anymore, especially after the pandemic. I used to be somebody that liked to know where things were going and how things were going. But now I'm on a placement year. I went into the placement year and my mindset was, oh, do a placement year, really impress this firm. They'll love you so much and they'll offer you a training contract. See, I still, still had my plan at the back of my mind. So I went and did that and did the placement year. There were 15 students on the, court, on the placement year that year. And I was the only one that was invited to an assessment day. So as you'd know, you know, with faith, you're thinking, God, you've chosen me, I, I will get it. You know, you, you go in there thinking that, it, it's, it must be me, this is a given, you know. I've, I'm the only one that's made it, it means it's mine. I went to the assessment days, guys. I don't know if you guys have been to assessment days yet, but I was in the deep end. I have never experienced anything like it ever before. The first person I spoke to told me that they'd been to five magic circles. So magic circle is like the legal big, big four. And they'd been, they told me, oh, I've just come from, um, I've been invited to all five assessments for, um, for law. And so this is kind of my, my, my time. So I basically was in the deep. The reason I tell you the story is because I learned at that assessment day how important it is to attend workshops about assessment days. Because again, it's a skill. So long story short, I didn't get that training contract. I was gutted, my heart was shattered. I was coming back to uni after having felt like I'd wasted a year, didn't have a training contract. What would be the next step? What would be the next plan? But this is why I'm saying it's important, as I say, in second year, still go for the placement, still go for the internships, because you need to have experience. Experience is vital, experience is crucial. Um, in my final year, um, I also started applying for grad schemes and entry level jobs, which is what you can do. And if you're in your final year now, that is um, another thing that you can start thinking about. So there are things that you can do whilst you're in uni in your first year, second year and third year. I'll let Topia talk about her journey. Yeah, so I just want to add, um, so final year, we've put in there beyond just graduate schemes. I think it's easy to just, especially if you're thinking about certain career paths, it's easy to go after the typical graduate schemes. but. There are entry level jobs that will take applicants, that will take graduates that won't necessarily say it. There are also junior position jobs, which a lot of graduates are always scared to go after because they read the description, they think, I don't have this experience, but they're always very open. And especially jobs that look like they provide an opportunity to gain a qualification, a lot of those jobs will like graduates. Um, and I just want to add, in terms of the first year when you're doing insight days and stuff, if you're not in a career that's very, very focus like medicine or dentistry or even law or anything like that or even if you are doing law explore don't just stick to the first thing that you thought of um, and you know this is a good part to talk about my journey so if you go a few slides down sorry we're gonna have to skip them if you go a few slides down where it says Charmaine's journey and then top his career journey no okay yeah so, um, so my journey was a bit all over the place. So I did an insurance in internship um, after A-levels, which was random. I wasn't expecting it. I was trying to get a retail job and found, found myself at Lloyds of London. Um, but it was really just to make some money. Um, and then in my, uh, sec after my second year, I did uh, investment banking. Sorry, during my first year of university, I did investment banking, insight days and stuff. I really thought I wanted to go into investment banking. I did some insight days and I decided, maybe not investment banking itself, maybe not IB. What about sales and trading? They have shorter work days. So I thought, oh, fantastic. I did a sales and trading internship in my second year and I absolutely hated it. So going back to what Charmaine was saying, sometimes you, don't, you think you know what you want to do. It's good to try and get some experience in those fields wherever you can because you might end up not liking it. There were various reasons why I didn't like it, which I might come to afterwards. But I just decided that wasn't for me, but it was fantastic to have done that at the time, because I was able to make that decision. Made a lot of money though, so. Money's your motivation, sales and trading is good. 
Um, I wanted to become a maths teacher much later on in my career, but because investment banking, sales and trading, because I decided that wasn't for me, I decided to pursue maths teaching earlier. So I did my PGT in secondary school maths. I taught for, after studying, I taught for a full year. And I decided that I don't want to kill myself. And honestly, like, teaching is the hardest thing I have ever done in my life, by the way. Bear in mind, I was on the sales and trading floor. Teaching is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, but instead of moving to another school, because I think it was also the school I was at, I decided that actually, let me explore some other stuff. So I found the higher education graduate scheme. How many of you know that there's such a thing as a higher education graduate scheme? How many of you even know what people who work in higher education do, besides lecturing? Like, besides the academic side? Kind of? Mm. Yeah, there's a whole area of jobs that I just was completely oblivious to. So I did a higher education graduate scheme. Now I'm a systems um, continual improvement manager at the University of Nottingham. Um, but as you can see, my journey is a little bit more windy because I don't have a specific career in, in future in mind, if that makes any sense. I don't know what I want to do next. I know I want to go up, but where up is, for me, is a bit more swirly-whirly. I, I get very bored easily, and I like to explore different career paths. So as you can see, me and Charmaine's journeys are very, very different in terms of um, moving forward. So we've got a slide on focused on one and open to all, because we know that for some of you, there's a career path that you specifically want, and you want to go after, and nothing's going to change your mind for different reasons. And for others, you have no clue what you want to do. And sometimes when you're in that position, you become kind of paralyzed with options where there's so much that I just don't know what to pursue. Um, and that's kind of where I was at. So benefits of being focused on one? Um, the benefits of being focused on one, I guess, um, would be, like I say, because even though it wasn't going as I had planned, I still knew what I wanted to do. And because it was a passion, I was determined. Um, as I say, it was important for me to, for myself, to, to show myself that I could do it. And even though I had hurdles, and there were many hurdles, um, I had to ensure that the passion was still there. So with that passion, I think being focused on one, the most times we're focused on one because it's what we want to do, it's what we love. And I think having that is, is really amazing. And I think that tends to be the drive, for me at least. My passion was my drive, and that's a huge benefit to that. Um, it helps you, even when you get knocked down many times, to get back up and keep going. And I think, um, yeah, as Topper say, it, it, it can work for you if, if you're passionate about it and if that's what you want to do. Your drive and your passion will keep you going. And of course, God and strength from God, because honestly, without that, you're not going anywhere. Um, so, yeah. Um, in saying that, though, I think I'll touch on the cons. And I say this because I've spoken to, so a lot, I had obviously a very big law friends that I made. And three quarters of my peers are not doing anything related to law. Um, okay, maybe I shouldn't say anything related. So they're not doing the strict barrister uh, solicitor route. They've actually broadened their careers and they've done so many other things with their degrees. And I think a law degree is great. Um, I say that because I've done law, but I think degrees in general are amazing because they will take you into the world of the working world. And some careers don't even require a specific degree, including law. You don't actually have to have done law to go and become a lawyer. Um, I say this because I think that a con with law is that some people come into it thinking, oh, you know, maybe their motivation is money. And they come into it thinking, you know, I'll choose law, I can make money with that. There's other ways to make money. And I think that um, speaking to some of my friends that have gone into law and changed their careers, they said, I wish I had understood what I can do with my degree so much sooner because then I would have been exploring other options a lot sooner and talking to people in other careers. As I say, my friends are in legal and compliance. My friends do regulatory. Some of my friends have gone on to do business. Some of them are in economics. There's so much you can do with your degree. And I think if you're focused on one thing, sometimes you feel like because you're not doing that one thing, you're failing. But actually, you being able to do your degree, graduate, and explore and adapt it to do something else is such an incredible achievement. And so I think that the con of being too focused sometimes is that you're almost tunnel vision and you can miss other opportunities that are for you, or it can take you a bit longer to, to kind of see that there are other opportunities because you think that not doing the solicitor barrister route or the, I don't know, pharmaceutical route or the biochemist route is going to mean I'm a failure, but that's not the case because if you can use your degree to go into a career and do what makes, like what drives you, if it's money, if it's having a career that you enjoy, then don't be too focused on one thing because you never know where other routes could take you. So I'd say that's a con of being too focused sometimes. Just really quickly, I'll go over the pros and cons of being open to all. 
there's much less room for disappointment, more room for exploring and changing your mind, which is, if you're like me, which is what you do. Um, and it's great, yeah, just like I said, if you get bored easily. Um, just like we were saying before, though, if you've done a certain degree, do not think you're, like, you're, that you're tired in the box. I know people who have done medicine degrees. That's a long time to study to decide you don't want to be a doctor or you know, do anything medicine related. But I know people who have done medicine degrees to satisfy their parents, for one in particular, and then decided, great, here's your degree, mum, dad, I'm going to go and do what I want to do. Some of them have gone into investment banking, accountancy, etc., etc. You do not, even when I was at an invest, the investment bank, I was told that they actually prefer people who haven't done finance-related degrees because they feel like they might have a broader range of experience. So do not feel like you're tied into the box of what you studied, no matter what it is that you've studied. Obviously, you can't study economics and then decide you want to be a doctor <laughs> overnight. You're going to have to do the, the degree to go with that. But just get yourself out of that box. Um, the, only, the disadvantages, I would say, is just obviously spreading your resources. When you're focused on one path and you're applying for the same types of programs over and over again, you get into the swing of things. You know exactly what you need to say to you know, push their buttons, all that kind of thing. But um, when you spread your resources, it obviously takes a lot more time to research and, and whatnot. Um, if we're just going to... Because I know our time is, base, is up. But the next slide um, talks about what's important for you. And this is just to get you thinking about... When you're thinking about your career, what kind of things do you want to look at? So for me, things like work-life balance was important. Money used to be important. Money's not as important for me anymore. But for others, it, it, I, obviously, I still want to make money, but it's not a driving force for me anymore. But for others, it will be. You want, you want to be earning however many figures. Um, doing a job that's impactful. Some people only want to do a job where they can see the impact in their community. Some people don't care about that. Stability, do you want a job that you know is not going to disappear and be re replaced by robots in the future? Um, and in progression, do you want a job where you kind of know what the next stages are? I can become a senior in this level, I can become this, I can become that. And status, like for me, I already told my husband, he's going to pay for my PhD so that I can be called doctor. <laughs> so things like that. Um, and then the, the next slide, but jump to the next, we'll skip. It's just to get you thinking about looking through the titles of jobs. Sometimes job titles will confuse you and you'll be like, this is not something I want to do. This is not something that sounds like I can transfer my skills to. But here we have some job titles that are really bizarre, but they're really, this is, these are just examples. I'm not saying you want to be a receptionist if you want to, okay. But director of first impressions. My favorite one is director of domestic affairs, which is a housewife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Revenue protection officer, which is a ticket inspector. So this is just to get you thinking. Look beyond job titles. They will confuse you. One thing in particular that I found, if you, if you go beyond the typical, um, the fields where, that are very specified, like law and whatnot, where you have to list and barrister, <coughs> like in my field in higher education, each university calls the same job a different thing. So look beyond, read about what the actual job does and decide if you want to do that. So we're going to go on to questions now. Um, pardon? So, yeah, so we're going to go into questions now, I think. Um, but one thing we did want to say, so the reason why we're presenting this to you today is because me and Charmaine have actually been working with um, Minister EA to try and put something together to support you guys in terms of career um, progression. Just like I mentioned before, we as a church, we're interested in you as a whole person, not just your spiritual life. Yeah. And it's important for us that you guys go into the world and be impactful in loads of different fields, but also be successful in those fields. Yes. So we're working on something called RY Pathways or Pathways, whatever you want to call it. And we do have some ideas yeah. already, but we do also want to put it to you guys to bring to us what you would like. So one of our ideas is a mentoring program. Another idea is people who have done interviews previously to tell us what type of questions they were asked by certain banks or certain companies so that we can keep those in file. And if you guys tell me, I've got an interview with JP Morgan, I can pull out the types of questions they ask, things like that. But it would be great to hear from you guys in terms of what type of support you would like from us. Yeah, no, that, I think Top has touched on, on that. I think with regards to the um, pathways, for me, the reason why this is something I'm really passionate about is because, um, as I said, interviewing assessment days, it's a skill. And I learned that very quickly. And if we can help you guys prepare for assessment days, interviews, workshops, networking, which I think is so important, as Top even mentioned, even in uni, to talk to your peers, networking is a key. When they say it's about who you know, that's the element of, of it's about who you know. If you are good at networking, you get to talk to the right people, and they'll be able to put you to the right people who will hopefully help you um, with you know grace and favor get to the right places so that is something that we are really um, wanting 
to do. But hopefully you guys have some suggestions for us as well in terms of what you would like to see um, us do as a church to help you guys further your careers and prepare for the working world as well. Um, as I say, that's something that we are very, we're hoping we'll be able to help you with um, in as much as we can. So now we're going into the Q&A session. As you can see on the screen, if you have a question, bring out your phone, um, find Slido and ask your question. We already have some questions in the bank and I will start with those. So a first question, which I think is a very important question is, how did you motivate yourself during uni? Um, do you wanna go? Yeah. Um, I think, for me, my motivation was my why. Um, and I, I've seen this just online and people talking about what is your why, but I think for me, I had to ask myself that question. What is my why? What is my end goal? What am I trying to achieve with this degree? Or what am I trying to achieve for myself? Um, and I think my why is what motivated me. Um, being able to sort of have a reason as to, and sometimes your why is just to get through it, just for me to get through it. And that's enough to get you out of bed and keep going. Um, but as we had put on the slide, hopefully we'll be able to share that if anyone wants to see it. Finding out why you're doing what you're doing, or at least for me, that was really important because that's what kept me going, even when I had rejections and when I just didn't want to go to the library to study. So that was my motivation. For me, it was just finishing what I started. It's important for me as a person to always finish what I started. And as much as I struggled at university, I, I, had, I had one of my own siblings laughing at me for the amount of effort I put into, um, I put into serving in so many different areas of my life, and I, and I said, you know what, I'm going to show you that God is faithful, and I'm I'm going to prove you wrong, and that's exactly what that was important to me, and that's exactly what I did. All right, great, thank you. So the next question is, how did you find a good balance between school, church, and social life? I guess Toby can start. You believe it's that ready? <laughs> Pia <Pee -abbas here. laughs> <laughs> Um. You know what, so my second year was a good feeler for me in terms of how I spent my time. Now, just like I said, because of my struggles with academics, I kind of started to realise how the amount of time I would actually need to do the type of revision that I needed to retain information for exams. Now, something that was very important for me was utilising the time that I actually had for stuff and making use of it. So, for example, actually going to lectures. Wow, it actually makes a difference, guys, when you actually attend lectures, I promise you. Um, <laughs> and doing the whole nine to six thing, so whether you have lectures or seminars or not, between nine and six, devoting that to your academics. In, your, in the gaps that you have, doing academic-related stuff. And you'll find that if you're consistent along the way, it'll be easier to balance the rest of the time that you have. Um, if I know I have work to do, so for, for me, I love to draw out kind of calendars and assign um, um, an amount of hours each day in a week or in a month to different things. And if I know that I didn't do what I needed to do on Tuesday, and then someone's asking me to go somewhere on Wednesday, I'm not going. Like, things like that, it's about being disciplined and knowing when to say no, not just saying, oh, you know what, I'll come back to that afterwards, because what if there's no time afterwards to come back to it because something else has popped up? And that's when you start getting overwhelmed. So for me, what worked was writing out the amount of time I had and assigning it to different things. And if I know, that on one day I tried to do it in this amount of time and that didn't work. I know next time I need to assign more time to that. Yeah? Um, and in terms of commitments, so if you become an RY exec or whatnot, normally in the beginning of the year you know exactly how much time you're going to need for the things that are core to your role. So I was a voices leader and at the beginning of the year we'd get a calendar first of all. So I knew for every Friday night visual I had to be at night visual. Block, that time was blocked out. Every Wednesday we had cell, time was blocked out. Every Wednesday before cell we had choir practices, that time was blocked out. So before the academic year really even got going, I, I already knew where my time was assigned to. I already knew that as a mass choir leader, as a voices leader at the time, that mass choir rehearsals were going to be from September to November. I blocked out time that I knew I was going to need for that. So then when I was planning, it wasn't, nothing was a surprise to me when I was told to come here or come there. So I keep looking at choir because, I'm not trying to indirect you guys, but I, I kept, I, <laughs> I kept, I, I always knew the amount of time I would need to assign to stuff and I would always add a little bit extra because obviously you need that. And I was just very realistic. So additional things, 
And bear in mind, I did give my time to things that were beyond my role sometimes because it was necessary, because I wanted to, because I knew I'd be useful there, because no one else was used, doing it, etc. However, there were some times when I just had to say no. So I'll give you an example really quickly. In my third year, when I was a voices leader as well, when I accepted the role, I didn't know for certain that we were going to complete an album that year. But during the summer, it was decided that Mass Choir were going to do an album. Now, I knew that I would not be able to commit the time I needed to it. I communicated that, that to the people who were leading on the album launch. And I, I committed the time that I was able to commit to it. So things like that. If it's beyond your role and you did not know it initially, still trying to accommodate if you can. But if you can't, being honest and just vocalizing it and communicating it to the people, to, to your leaders. Just like I said, if anybody ever feels like I'm not prioritizing the academics and I'm adding stuff onto them that they weren't expecting, I, I would want them to communicate that to me. But that was important for me. But communication, definitely, if you've accepted roles that have that take time as well. All right, um, Charmaine, anything to add to that? Or? No, I think Tom has touched all on, right. on it. So the next question is, is, did you ever struggle with depression or low moods during your studies? Yes. No. So, <laughs> so we have completely different experiences there. And I think one thing that is important to acknowledge is that uni can be a very stressful time. Yes. It can be very demanding. Um, for a lot of people, it's the first time that they're away from home. It can be the first time that they're in another country, another city, things like that. And sometimes the pressure of the course itself can cause um, things to happen to you as well. So I think the most important thing is to speak out. I mean, have things like RY so that you have a community around you. Um, you are connected to people who can pray for you. You have access to the senior pastor and all the pastoral teams as well. And also within like university settings, you have things like the counselling team. You have pastoral teams within um, your lectures and things like that. So don't feel afraid um, to speak to them. Can I just add on? As someone who works in a university, I see with a lot of the type of support we offer students, support is very underused by people from ethnic minority backgrounds very underused in terms of like using career services as well but even stuff like when, when you're going through challenging mental times with depression and whatnot other people are very very quick to use the services and they do get the support that they need yeah. and a lot of us aren't and that's me coming I work in student services at the University of Nottingham and I see it firsthand so I will ask you guys also to make use of those services and let them know if you are having challenges and you're not able to submit work on time, don't just hand in your work and get capped because you probably don't need to do that. Yeah? Thanks. Well, let me just come also from the perspective of a doctor. Mm. Now, as a GP, now it's very sad when you look at people, even in this church, without me knowing, they, somebody who has slept the exam, it's not been feeling well. And it's an important exam. Because they didn't contact the GP, nobody knows he's going through anything. She had to withdraw from that course. For a simple reason that you know, like Topo said, you have our white colleagues, counterparts. When they have a little issue like this, they let the GP know. So I want you to have that record. Once you have that record, don't don't prove to be superhuman. Be sincere with yourself. You have an issue. If you just have that record, the GP also will support you and the, 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 no matter amount of time you need, they will give it to you. All right, so don't keep things to yourself. The being depressed or being anxious is becoming increasingly, you know, high among young people now, yeah. more than ever before in our generation. That is statistics. It's not. He said he's been depressed before. Does that stop people uh, from being who she is now? She managed it too well. She can If you need to speak to people, that's the most important thing. Speaking to the right people. Get help on time. He said, it's like somebody who has pneumonia, who has antibiotics, or has support, or somebody who has diabetes and get treated. So it's nothing different. So let's not put a taboo or a stigma around it and keep it to yourself. All right, thank you. All right, the final question for this session is, please can you give me advice on how to tell my parents that I want to switch university course? Well, um, I think the 
the best thing um, you can do with your parents, and I know it's not always easy because some parents, they have plans for you too, and we, we can appreciate where they're coming from. Um, but I think one of the best things I did with my dad was to communicate, and it was very important for him to, even if he didn't understand it, for me to be able to explain to him um, something that I wanted to do and why I wanted to do it. And I think that sometimes our parents, um, well, from my experience at least, they, they worry about whether or not, they, they, the reason they want you to do something is because they believe that's the be all and end all. And you know, if you want to switch your degree and your course, I think when you have a plan and when, you, when you're almost sure of what you want to do and you explain that to them and you talk them through it, being able to see that in you sometimes is really helpful. So I know it's such a cliche, but honestly, I believe communication is so key and it's so powerful. And just being able to speak to your parents, but pray about it, because I, I do appreciate that some parents, it's not as easy as, mum, dad, can we have a talk? It's not as easy as, I've got a plan, this is what I want to do, so you have to honour it. Um, sometimes you do have to pray, and you have to ask God for help. Yeah. And as I say, I had to do it, I had to have that discussion with my, with my parents, with my dad, and I do believe those two components were really important. Him being able to see that passion in me, and for me to be able to communicate what I was trying to do and why I wanted to do it, I think he saw that and he was able to honour it. I mean, this is an awkward question for me because my dad didn't know what, what I studied until I graduated. So <laughs> he thought I was doing an accountancy degree and then came to my graduation and it wasn't. So, um, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, quite mad. So uh, this is the thing is, this question can be quite difficult to answer because I, we don't know, the person who's asking, we don't know your parents and we don't know how they respond to different things. So I know that for me, with my mum, all I have to do is tell her the impact it's having on me and shed a little tear. And she's, <laughs> do what's going to make you, my darling, please don't, you know? Very, with my dad, I just do stuff and he sees the result and he's happy as long as he sees the result. Just like Charlene mentioned, sometimes they just want to know that there's, you know, success at the end of it. Um, but for that individual, it's going to be difficult to say. But my advice would be, let them know the impact and the reason, and just like Charmaine said, lay out what, what you think the future, what they want to know is what job can you get at the mm -hmm. end of it. I know for a lot of Nigerian parents, that's what they want to know. What, what job can you get with this degree at the end? But if you're still struggling with that and you'd like to speak to one of us or anybody at the end, please yeah. do come and give us a bit more details on the situation without going too much, and we might be able to give you a bit more advice. All right, on that to your final round of applause for Super. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for such an impactful session. Um, the Slido link that we're using is going to be throughout the whole conference. If you have any questions regarding this session, when you're typing your question, just say something like Charmaine Toppe, or write a question, and we will get them all answered and sent out to you guys um, at a later date. Um, we are now going into the next session, and I'd like to invite Pastor Labby. Everybody give a round of applause for Pastor Labby. All right, can we just appreciate Bishop Tokwe and Bishop Charmaine one more time? You know, um, just before I call um, our next um, speaker, you know, I'm privileged that I've been the youth pastor for Radiki Youth for... nineteen twenty nine. 12 years, 12 years, right? So as a result, you know, I was here when Topper came to university, when Charmaine came to university, and I was part of their university journey. You know, and Topper had, Top had two friends, Shola and Abigail, they were all together. They were all, you know, so it's important that you, you have a balance in whatever you do, okay? Even as you're serving God, don't do too much, like you said, I'm not going to do anything to her. It's important that, it is important that we do things right, okay? We try to tell people, don't be in too many departments, okay? If you're a youth church leader, for example, now, you can't be a, if you're an exec, you won't be a youth church leader, except you feel God wants you to be. We try to help each other, okay? But what is important is just trust God. The faith, the faith, the, the God factor is so important. I mean... I used to pick up Charmaine in first year, back, if you, if you know Nottingham, back in Clifton. She was always in church. Most of the time, she'd be waiting for me <laughs> to get her. She's always ready. I'm always late. You know, but the point I'm making, both of them love God. 
as, in as much as facing their studies. Okay, so please, no, you cannot apply faith to laziness. You cannot apply, you cannot be lazy and you think I have faith in God. Tokma was saying in, in second year, she did so much in church. She was always in church. Even in her final years, she was still an exec, but she was able to balance. You know you spent a lot of time in church and you still go home and go and watch Netflix when your friends, when you're meant to be studying and you think you will pray, God will just do magic. That's laziness. God, faith does not work with laziness. Faith, faith is meant to be the icing on the cake when you've done the hard work. Does that make sense? So please don't be lazy and think faith will work for you. It won't work. You've got to put the work in because you can't spend so much time in church and go home and go and sleep or go and watch Netflix or go and, when you have deadlines. No. Okay, but I pray God help us in the name of Jesus. Um, the speakers will be more than happy to have a chat with you one-on-one -on -one if you want to go and meet them, get their details, more information. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to do that. Praise God. Let me just, let me just say this on now. My little experience has shown that there are some parents who are very, very uh, maybe traditional or should I say African that you just say you must do this. They don't, they're not flexible. Now, we are here as your spiritual parents. Many a times when people are well, I mean, I'm not saying this to despise anybody. All, it depends on what experience our parents have gone through. It also depends on the level their, their, their life view, their view of life generally. So they may not be able to see from your own perspective. So, and they are very dogmatic, you have to do it this way. So if that is your type of parents, please, what you need to do, let's, we, do, we won't want you to do something against your parents or fight them, come and seek cancer from us. Either you had want you want to do your career change or anything like that, and you know that their mommy are promised difficult, and you don't know what to do. Please talk to us. There's no point struggling in the course because mom and dad want me to do it and struggle in it and fail. It's no point. It's better to be in your comfort zone. It's better to excel. Even if you have the first class in history, because that history is your passion, you can take that and use it to work everywhere than having a third class or a pass in the very good course because I would not go take you anywhere. So please, we are here for you. Either you are in Nottingham or you are in Norwich or in Lancaster or Preston, anywhere you are, we are here for you. Just speak to us, we will, we will talk to you. God bless you. you I'm wondering, I know where you come from. <laughs> All right, let me not take too much of our time. Um, we're going to have a relationship talk now. Um, from our very own Pastor Fumi, um, I'm going to allow the multimedia to introduce her. And after, after the introduction, please get your questions ready. Okay, I know you guys love questions. We're ready for you, Lord. Okay, after the Q&A... Pastor Fumi Alawale is the resident pastor of God's Vineyard Church, Nottingham, Most and president and of... Pastor on stage. And then they're going to answer the questions. So over to you, Multimedia. Pastor Fumi Alawale is the resident pastor of God's Vineyard Church, Nottingham, and president of the Women of Excellence. A seasoned, compelling, and insightful teacher of the word who provides mentoring and spiritual counsel to women in ministry, young couples, singles, mothers in waiting, and parents. She travels across the UK to minister and strengthen the radical youths, particularly the young ladies. Pastor Fumi holds a PhD in physiotherapy. She is a former lecturer and former practice manager at the Lenten Medical Center, Nottingham. She is married to Dr. Ezekiel Alawale, the senior pastor of God's Vineyard Ministries. They are blessed with three lovely children and grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as we welcome this anointed woman of God, Pastor Fumi Alawale. We have too much noise. But thank God we're here. And uh, for those people from outside of Nottingham, Lovebro, Derby, Lancaster, Preston, Norwich, and those watching online, I welcome you to this wonderful time. 
the Lord will reach out unto every one of us and uh, bless us. Shall we pray together? Our Father and our God, we thank you for this morning. We worship you for what you're doing with lives. Thank you for turning our lives around. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Thank you for this time with you on relationship. Uh, we, I ask that you take it over. Grant every one of us understanding of what you have and let release upon our lives the grace to be doers, not hearers alone. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Um, I have 20 minutes from what I was told. So I will try and be fast. Uh, we do whatever is possible, and then maybe we go into question time. I'm, go I'm going to be reading from Malachi 2. Um, to save my time, uh, you can write it down, and I need you to write something down. You don't go to lectures without writing things down. You may not be able to remember all I have to say. So write something down so that you can go back like Berean Christians and look at it again. Okay? So I'm reading Malachi 2, 13 to 15. Uh, but, um, okay, let me just read it, 13 to 15. And I'm reading from Message. It says, and here is a second offense. You fill the place of worship with your whining and snivelling because you don't get what you want from God. Do you know why? Simple. Because God was there as a witness when you spoke your married vows to your young bride. And now you've broken those vows, broken the faith bound with your vowed companion, your covenant wife. God, not you made marriage. His spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And what does he want from marriage? Children of God, that's what. So guard the spirit of marriage within you. Don't cheat on your spouse. The reason why I read this scripture, I know we're talking on relationship, but I believe that this relationship thing that we're talking about, you don't just want to do relationship for one year, two years, three years. You want it, no matter how long you're doing it for, to end in marriage. That's the, the desire of everyone. Because by the time you have wasted two years in relationship with a young man or a young woman, and after two years, you said, no, I'm not interested again. That's a waste of your time. So, and I want you to know that this is a serious matter. Um, I've been married for maybe 36 years now. <laughs> so <laughs> I know, and I've had opportunity to see marriages, to talk to people, to, to relate with so many families. And I know this is important. In fact, before I left the, the office this morning, <laughs> Pastor Wally was telling me that there is a difference between complete and finish. You know? There's a difference between complete and finish. When something is complete, it means you are fulfilled. And he said, when something is complete, when you marry right, eh, you are complete. When you marry wrong, hey, you are totally finished. <laughs> <laughs> so that is it. And I want you to put that behind. You cannot afford to marry wrong. No matter how good you are in your career, <laughs> no matter how you know, great you are in what you do as a job, if you get marriage wrong, is disaster. And thank God we have the Spirit of God who is there to guide us and lead us in the way to go. And that's why I read that uh, scripture. God is the one that originated marriage. And marriage is one of the oldest institution or the most important institution in life. It's the oldest. It was ordained by God. It was God that said to Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. I'll get you somebody. So it is God that ordained marriage. It's not important what anybody is saying about marriage. What is important is what God is saying about marriage. And so you may listen to different people on YouTube. I, I, I listen to different people. But sometimes I look at them. When you're listening to people, you need to look at their marriage. Is this the kind of marriage I want? Is this the kind of relationship I want? Even though they're talking well, they talk good, but you don't want to end like them. 
So marriage is a marathon. It is a long trip. It is not a sprint. It's not, oh, I get into it. If it's good, I get out. It, it doesn't work like that. You know, if I take two sheets of paper and I gum it together, no matter how perfect this is, if for any reason I have to rip them out, you won't get it as clean as it is now. You get it. So there will be things that will be damaged. There will be tear there and there. So it's so, so important that we get it right. And there is no middle ground. Relationship or marriage is always a union of two imperfect people who can only find perfection in Christ. And that's why I'm happy that you're here this weekend. I'm happy that you, are, you know Jesus because that's the beginning of the things. So a lot of times as people will go to you know, fast food, go to McDonald's, drive through, buy it, go to this. You just want to get everything fast. It doesn't work like that with marriage. And that's why a lot of the attention we give to our education, you come here, some of you are doing three-year course, four-year course, five, you know. Some we finish, like uh, Shami finished three-year course. She's still saying she's finishing her training course. So we do all this when it comes to our education. You can't drive it, a, a car in this England without doing the theory test and passing it, without going for practical lessons and training and passing it. You may do it 10 times. You are not allowed to drive until you have passed it. But marriage as it is, is the only course you get. In. You just get the certificate before you even start the course. And if I want to ask any one of us as we sit down here, be sincere. I know you're a child of God, you won't lie. <laughs> How many have read a book on marriage in the last six months? Six months. Good. Clap for the, this young man. <laughs> and uh, Shami and Tokwe are raising their hand, hands. You can imagine out of all of us, only one person. <laughs> Okay, uh, Pastor Miwa, you are a married man, so you will read. <laughs> Praise God. So you see that a lot of time we don't give the necessary attention to marriage. We spend so much time looking to buy fine dress, looking for fine picture, look, doing photo shoot. You put all that <laughs> on Facebook. And if you end in disaster, those pictures will remind you of, of pain. So... Instead of putting so much attention on all those things, getting the, 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 the most expensive rings and waving your hand everywhere, do the right thing. <clears throat> Put all your energy into yourself and that focus that you have ahead of you. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I was looking at the UK divorce rate. It is estimated at 42%. Over 100,000 British couples got a divorce in 2019. This is the report as at September 2021. And it's, it's not just that these people are unbelievers. It's happening among Christians. It's happening with pastors. So don't think that uh, I'm a Christian, it cannot happen. It can happen. So that's why marriage is hard work. It's a beautiful thing, but you have to work at it. Now, a lot of time, the causes of all the problems in marriage is traceable to ignorance and lack of preparation. And it's necessary that we prepare. If we can read and study for driving a car, you need to read and study for getting married. So what are the, my topic this morning is marrying right. You have to marry right. Tell your partner, marry right. <coughs> It's so, so important. <laughs> it's important. Praise God. You are taking my time, okay? Praise God, praise God. You are taking my... Is that the correct time? Nine minutes? When did I start? I've not started, though. <laughs> 
I'm just talking introduction. So what are the things that we need to do to have a perfect marriage? To have a good marriage, a lasting relationship, a loving, lasting relationship. The first thing is solid foundation. Having a good marriage is not by luck. It's not by chance. It is having a solid foundation. A successful marriage does not just happen. It will not just happen. So, if uh, Brother Adam and Sister Eve, that God, you know, it was God that said, Abraham, this is Adam, this is your wife. And God constituted the marriage ceremony. If they had issues, we can't escape it. You get it. So that's why it is important. So, how do we nurture our marriage or our relationship? The way you handle issues in relationship will go a long way. So foundation is so, so, so key. It is not the beauty of a building. You may see a beautiful building. If this foundation is bad, it's a matter of time. The Bible says if the foundation be destroyed, what will the righteous do? So if your foundation in marriage is key, and so we don't take it lightly. So it is the construction, this is one, one David Allen that said this. He said, it is not the beauty of a building you should look at. It's the construction of the foundation that will stand the test of time. In Bible, in Matthew 7, 24 to 27, 24 to 27 the Bible talked about you know, two people. One building their house on the rock and the other one on the sand. He calls one a foolish man. He calls one a wise man. And he said, when the storm comes, no matter how spiritual you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter how intelligent or educated you are, storms will definitely come. We have some married people here this morning. We, we go through storms at one time or the other in our lives. It will come. It will come to the poor. It will come to the rich. It will come to the wise. It will come to the poor or the foolish. The only thing that make that building stand is that foundation that is on the rock. And thank God we have Jesus as our foundation. It's the rock. It's the foundation on which our relationship must be built. And that means you follow what the word of God says. You live by the standard of the word of God. That is so, so key. So, build on that rock. He's the one that can sustain you. How can you talk about foundation? It starts from deciding who to marry. You need to decide who you want to marry. And God is there to lead you. He wants to lead you. We have to be absolutely dependent on him. Zero dependence on your wisdom. It talks in, um, in, in the Bible, it says... Um, what is it that I want to say now? Okay, let me just continue. You cannot afford to rely on your wisdom or your knowledge. You, you can't do it by yourself. But you need God. It's only God that knows a good sister. It's only God that knows a good man. There is no good man on the surface of the earth. The only thing that makes us good is that spirit of God that is on the inside of us. And once a man is submitting to the spirit of God, he becomes a good man because you're living by the word of God. So, Ecclesiastes 4.12 talks about a three cord that cannot be broken. The three cord in that, in that scripture is God himself who originated marriage, the man and the woman. Once you leave, leave out God in that relationship, you're heading for disaster. And that's why you cannot just marry anybody, not even because they come to church, not because they sing well in choir, not because they dress well or act well. You see somebody that sings, they will not continue to sing to you in your house. You will see a pastor, he will not come in, be coming home and preaching to you. So no, even the when they talk well, they, will, they may come home and become something else. I read of a story of a pastor, of a woman, a pastor's wife. She carried her bag and baggages with her children one day and came to the altar 
and sat down. So people were asking, what, I said, I want to marry this, the man that is on this altar. They said, you are already married to him. He said, no, the man that I married to is a different man in the house. I want to marry this one that is on the altar. So people can change. And that's why you need God to make a choice. And the Lord, I know, will help us. So apart from that foundation, there are pillars for support. The body of Christ is there. That's why you are here this morning. We are here because the Bible talks about the older women teaching the younger women. We have gone through experiences. You don't need to go through bad experiences before you learn your lesson. You can learn from the experiences of others. And that's why it's good to read books. It's good to listen. I remember when we were in university, we were going from one marriage seminar to the other. We were not even planning wedding. But we were encouraged to go. We would go, we listen. So we knew mistakes that people have made. And we can, through that, say, OK, what can I do to, to remove this? So, so important. Charm, the Bible says, is deceptive. And beauty does not last. A woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. When I was in university, or even when I've had my three kids, I was weighing 48, 52 kilos. I had that weight with my weight. It was in England that I became big like this. So, <laughs> so beauty <laughs> will not last. What is important is the character of the person you are. The man that is looking handsome today, if he doesn't have that character, you see an handsome man beating a beautiful girl. So it's not by beauty, it's by God. So, so if they go to church, oh, they carry Bible, they speak well, all those things are good, but it's not important. What is important is the personal relationship with God. Okay, thank you. <laughs> personal relationship with God. So make sure that the person you are relating with knows God, fears God. You know the story of Joseph. It would have been good for Joseph to just enjoy Potiphar's house. But one thing that kept him from Potiphar's wife was the fear of the Lord. Anyone that does not fear God, run away from those, that kind of person, no matter how beautiful or handsome or good looking they are. Fear of the Lord is what keeps a man and keeps a woman, making them to behave well in the home. Praise God. Number two, you need to know yourself. The journey of a good marriage starts with you knowing yourself. If I don't know myself, I won't know what I'm looking for in a man. I just think, oh, any man that is just a brother, I can marry them. You need to know yourself. And how do you know yourself? This time that you're single, you're not married, the Bible says they that are married seek to please their husband. But the single ones seek to please the Lord. This is the time you can discover who you are. This is the time you can discover yourself. Reading, looking in words, what is it about me? Asking God to reveal you to you. So it's important that you know yourself. And this is the time you need to invest in yourself. You need to learn things. I talk to a lot of young girls. They say, oh, me, I don't like cooking. My, my, my boyfriend likes cooking. He will be the one cooking. Ask all the married ones, how many times have you been cooking in your house? I'm not saying men should not know how to cook. They should know how to cook. But there are things that are peculiar, that the way it is made, will you, your husband is looking for money. You are in the house with the children. You are waiting for one man to come back and cook for you. It doesn't work like that. So if you don't know how to cook, go and learn to cook. There are things you can invest your time in. You know, we spend a lot of time on Facebook, on anything. Instagram, all those things. Those times can be invested in doing something nice, something good. Develop skills that will help you in relationship. So your single years are not meant to be a waste. In fact, it is the best time of your life. So enjoy it as long as it lasts. When you see your friends having a boyfriend, don't care about it. Just keep your focus on God. Keep your focus on God. 
It's the best time of your life. Don't be depressed because somebody, your friend, is getting married and you, have not even, you don't even have a boyfriend. Don't be depressed, depressed about that. Instead, invest your time in yourself and in your relationship with God. And at the right time, the right man, the right woman will come and you'll be happy for it. You need to, this is the time you need to discover your purpose. This is the time you need to discover yourself. You need a life before you can pick a life partner. You can't, if you don't have a life, how will you pick a life partner? It's not possible. So you need a life to pick a life partner. And also, you need a purpose for life before you pick a life partner. You remember, Adam had something doing. He was busy in the garden doing what God wanted him to do before God brought Eve into his life. Don't, don't just pick a man that has no purpose, no future ambition, NFA. <laughs> Anywhere is where. Be careful with such people. Your journey for finding the right spouse starts with you. You must be the right person to find the right person. So, so key. And nobody is there to complete you. You are complete as a person. If you think you are not complete, you are not ready for marriage. You are not ready for relationship. No man completes a woman. No woman completes a man. So you need to complete. See yourself as a complete person. The Bible says we are complete in Christ. So when you are complete in Christ, a complete person is coming to another complete man for them to become one. So you need to be complete. Hallelujah. Number three, don't be desperate. A lot of times we we are desperate. (laughs) Especially as women. (laughs) We feel, uh, you know, by the time you are getting to final year, your mom, your dad, mommy is calling you, oh, defend me, what is going on? <laughs> we want to know the guy now. Bring him home. Let's see. They are putting pressure. By the time you have two months to finish, everybody is on your case. <laughs> what is happening? Don't let anybody pressure you into choosing somebody. Don't be pressured by friends. Let, let people marry at 21. That is them. There is a plan and purpose that God has for you. And the Bible says the plan of God for your life is for good and not for evil. To give you that expected end. Some people feel, oh, I'm getting to 25 now. So uh, I need to get somebody. Don't be pressured to get married. When you are desperate, you can make mistakes. Any man that comes, you will just accept them. You won't see anything. You say, ah, at least I have somebody. Let me just, I will, I will change him. You can't change anybody. The only person that changes human being is the spirit of God. So don't be pressured into marriage. Your friend may be getting married. Your cousins may be getting married. Your, even your colleagues. But instead of being pressured, turn to God. Let the wedding bells be ringing everywhere. Your own will ring at the right time. Praise the Lord. And it is not about getting married. It is about being happily married. You can get married and be sad and be miserable. But when you are married and you are joyful, you are happy in your marriage, that is what every parent is looking for and crying for. And let let that be your focus. Don't rush into anything. Marriage is not an end in itself. It's just a means to an end. So let God lead you. Ask yourself, do I know him well enough? Do I know her well enough? Don't just say, oh, we've been together for a long time. You may be together for eight years and yet you don't know them. We courted for four years, I think four years. And when we got married, there are a few things, there are lots of things that I didn't know that he didn't know about me. Because there's nobody that, you, you are not living with me, so you won't know me that well. So it's not the, it's, it's not the, 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 oh, we've been together for five years, we just must marry now. Know him well, know him well, and the Lord will help us. Take time to know each other. All this, I want to get married attitude, deal with it and kill it. It's not, it's not a good attitude. Let God be the one leading you. Desperation reduces your chance, 
your chances of making a good decision. And I want to emphasize real, uh, friendship. You know, cultivate friendship among everybody. Befriend your, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Just be friends. You know, immediately somebody is showing interest or you, are, you see a man coming close to you, taking you out and all that. Your guard is up. You want to now start pretending. You start acting. <laughs> but in, in real friendship, no acting. Just be yourself. As ladies, be yourself. Don't let any man make you pretend. When you pretend, you pretend to get married. Pretense will not keep that marriage. And when a man discovers that this is the real you, or a woman discovers that this is the real you, it's a problem. And you are heading for disaster. When you fake it, there will be troubles. When it's discovered. And when we start faking it, you might even miss the right person. Because the person that this guy, that God has showed him, is a girl that is down to earth. He says it as it is. But you say, oh, Hey, what do you think? Ah, yeah, anything you say is correct. Ah, be careful. Don't pretend. Say it as you want it. Okay, I don't believe in what you are saying. This is what I believe in. If he wants you, fine. If he doesn't, let him go. Don't I say yes, yes to everything he says because you don't want to lose him. The Bible says, a prudent wife, a prudent wife. Okay, let me read it as it is. Proverbs 19, 14, write it down especially men. Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers. But a prudent wife is from the Lord. Prudent wife is from God. So that's why you need to relate with God and let him be the one to lead you. He said in Proverbs 18.22, the man who finds a wife finds a treasure and receives favor from the Lord. Hallelujah. So, okay, that's number two is what I've talked about now. So find yourself, find your purpose, find God, and know your values. Let me talk about values because of my time. There is nothing that is valuable that is easy to get. And as a woman, know that you are valuable. The Bible says our price is far above rubies. I, don't, I can't remember. There was a time I went and read, and read about rubies. Rubies are very expensive stones. I can't quote the price now, but very expensive. But the Bible even says you are far, far, your price is far above rubies. You are precious to God. You are valuable in the sight of God. So be careful. Nobody will increase your value for you. You have to know that you are a valuable person. And when you are, as a woman, you are chasing a man, you are not valuable. The man should woo you. He should be the one chasing you. Don't go and be cooking for anybody because you want them to, ah, why? You are, you are too valuable. Don't go and be washing their clothes. And arranging their rooms. What are you looking for? So, so important. You are so valuable. You are so precious to God. Let them woo you. When you are the one who following them, running after them, I've seen people that, that a man was saying, when they got married, I, I didn't want to marry you. You were running after me. And he says that all the time to her. That is killing for anybody. So it's the man that you, it's, it's the man that is supposed to be finding you. Don't go and be finding them. You know God has spoken to you about this man. Begin to pray for him. In fact, as much as possible, don't go and be looking. Hey, hello, how are you, Peter? Are you okay? So I, I, I just, I just made some fried rice, and I said I should come and give him. Why? Don't give, give him food. In fact, run away from him and face God. Let God be the one to introduce you. Hallelujah. If you are valuable, you won't allow anyone to test drive you. I've seen ladies, how can I prove my love for him? 
I've seen men say, I have to, I have to know where, if you are sexually compatible. If you now try it and you are not compatible, what will happen after that? You drop out, go for another one. Don't let any man test, test drive you. You are not a, a car to be test driven. That is correct. Ah. That's right. You are a child of God, a daughter of Zion. That's right. If he wants to try it, let him go. The right man will come. Because by the time he comes and test drive you, he goes to another one and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the way men are, they talk about it. You say, ah, that girl, she's very cheap. So that, uh, his friend will come when he has left you. Don't, be, don't allow anyone to test drive you. It is against God. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. You are not a car. You have a soul. You get it? You are not a car. You, are, you have a soul. And even in cars, Pastor Me likes, likes, likes cars. It's not every car you can go and they allow you to test drive it. So you are so precious to God. And every sexual relation affects your soul. And that's why you cannot give yourself away. Sex is for marriage. So run away from it. If you are not married, you have been having sex, stop it. Because God is not happy. And it is a sin against your soul. The Bible says every other sin that you commit, the only one that is against your soul is the sin of sexual immorality. Let God help you in the name of Jesus. Know the qualities you are looking for. My time is up. They gave me extra 10 minutes. So, <laughs> Know the qualities you are looking for. Be sincere with yourself and ask the right questions. I'm not saying go to a man and say, oh, I want to ask you this question. If you are asking them, they will tell you the answer you want to hear. So what I'm saying is this. You, you, you are a woman of wisdom, a man of caliber. When you are relating with somebody, you'll be looking at them. How do they relate with other people? How do they talk about their pastors? How does he relate with the father or the mother? How does he relate with the sister? How is it with money? What does he say about when he comes to church asking for tithes? You need to know all that. When you are going to church and you say, oh, uh, you say, are you the one that killed Jesus? Run away from such people. Because by their fruits, you will know them. So if you are not asking this, the right questions, don't ask, do you love me? Ah, everybody will say, I love you. We don't even know. We, don't even, we are confused with the definition of love. <laughs> we don't know what love is. But the love that God wants that can keep your relationship is the unconditional love. The love that accepts you for who you are. The love that accepts you for who you are. It's not because of if you, if you want to, to, to show that you love me, you have to sleep with me. Let him go. I had, um, I wanted to bring that, to get the real thing. I had a video, um, YouTube thing. One of my nieces showed it to me. This girl was beaten and battered. Her eyes were swollen, her faces, bruises everywhere. And she came on YouTube saying, please advise me. What do you want me to do? This guy said he lost me. That he's, he's only testing me whether he, by be, he beats him, he beats her every day. And this girl is saying, you know, if you look at the girl, even with the bruises and the swollen eyes, she's still a beautiful girl. Why will you say, because a man say, I'm only testing whether you love me. Ah, they cannot be beating you. If they are beating you in relationship, relationship is when you enjoy most. Too. The man loves you. He's showering you love. He's buying gifts for you. After marriage, we can even forget your bad day. <laughs> That's meant for you. So if before marriage is beating you, he will double it when you are married because he knows there is nowhere you're going. Please, don't let anybody steal you. You are too precious to God. And these days, I know that there are some women that are beating men. Men, if a woman <laughs> is beating you, 
Don't marry that woman. No. Run away. Praise the Lord. Don't ask him, oh, okay, oh, out of all, why, why, are you, why do you want to marry me? <laughs> he will tell you, I love your shape. That shape will change. <laughs> oh, I love the way you sing. That voice will change. I used to sing very well before. <laughs> but when I stop doing voice training, I can go from one key to the other. <laughs> you know? I was a very powerful sono, soprano singer. My voice was. <laughs> but uh, I may not be able to sing. Don't let, let, don't let people say, I'm the only son of my mother, and my mother wants a grandson. When you have given him grandson, he will run away. That's not a reason to be married to him. I think I should just stop. Oh, I still have two minutes. Okay, praise God. <laughs> praise God. Don't, don't say because, oh, he's a singer, I'm also a singer. When we get to the, the, our ministry is not going the same way. Don't marry somebody that is a singer because you are singing together. Except God says, that is your man. You won't be singing in the house. Don't marry, yo, he has a very, very wonderful preaching ministry to the youth. He speaks well. He will not be ministering to the youth in your house. It may not speak well in the house. So what is important is what God is saying to you. If the reasons are not tangible, you are already setting us, yourself up for failure. Be sincere with yourself. Know him very well. And be sure he's indeed a child of God. Who are his influences? I'll be rounding up on this. Who are the people that can talk to him? Who are the people he knows? Who are the people he relates with? The Bible says, a friend of the foolish will also be foolish. A friend of the wise will be wise. He says, show me your friends, and I will tell you the kind of person you are. If you, the person you, that is a child of God, all his friends are drunkards. He says, what of time you begin to drink? If all his friends beat people, it's a matter of time. He'll begin to beat you as well. So look at who are these people. Can somebody talk to him? Can he be angry? And the pastor said, no, don't do that. And he listens. There are people that say, oh, I'm a private person. This relationship, don't, I don't want you to share it with anybody. Let it just be. Don't run away from people like that. Why will you keep relationship private? He's keeping it private so that the other girlfriend in London will not know it's a relationship. <laughs> yes, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> so don't, don't let anybody push you into trouble. Who are his, his role models? If his role models have two wives, he might follow them. Who are his mentors? Mentors are, are key. You have people that have gone ahead of you. They've passed this level that you are. They can help you. They can guide you. Don't say, oh, I don't need any mentor. I'm, I'm, I, I'm a self-made man. Who are you that you are self-made? There is no self-made person. Somebody in life helped you to where you are. So don't let anybody say, oh, we don't need mentors. You need somebody that can guide you so that, you know, you, you won't do, have mistakes that everybody has made. And who does he listen to? Wrong person? he will act wrongly. If he listens to a wrong person, he will begin to act wrongly. Is he a lone rangers? They don't respect anybody. When you ask them, who is your mentor? They say, ah, Jesus Christ is my mentor. Jesus Christ is your mentor. But Jesus Christ has also brought people into your life to guide you in the way to go. Beware of people like that. Hallelujah. And I think I should stop on that. There must be somebody, a man or a woman can listen to. He's doing what is not right. He's called to order and he says, yes, I will do it. As old as we are in marriage, I know people to call when my husband misbehaves. And once they can only, they will say to him, ma'am, he has to obey. If you are not, if, you, if the man you are relating with or the woman you are relating with, nobody, even the parent cannot talk to him or her. 
run away from such a person. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Mentors are there to prevent us from tormentors. Your mentor is not your friend. They won't say what you want to hear. They tell you the truth. This is the standard of the word of God. If you have mentors that are your friend that are pampering you, using their hand to rub your head when they know you are on the way to destruction, those are not your mentors. Hallelujah. They are going to tell you the truth and what you need to know. There must be role models, mentors, people that can influence you. And you must also know his friends. He must know your friends as well. Hallelujah. Don't marry anyone that is a freelance Christian. Oh, which church do you go to? I go to anyone that I like. You must have a pastor over your head. People like that, they don't have anybody. So when they misbehave, you can't talk to anybody. So please, it's so, so important. The excuse is, there is no good church. There is no good person. The only person that makes us good is that spirit of God in us. So if, no, if you are a bad man and you enter a good place, you make the place bad. So that's why we need each other. The Bible says don't, don't neglect the fellowship of one another. So... Let me stop so that we don't keep going. Pilab, over to you. Let's put our down, Pastor Paul. Okay, so um, we're going to go into a time of Q&A now. Um, Let's keep clapping on the on the Let's keep clapping. And then we're going to invite two of our other senior pastors, Pastor Joe and Pastor Mura Boy. Let's put them both of them as they come forward. Um, so we're going to go into the Q&A now. Um, and the first question, the first question says, is it fine to marry a man that is a few months or a year younger than you, even if he's mentally and spiritually mature? The answer is no. All right. Um, the, I, uh, my, my answer would be, it is not wrong. But you that is going to marry a man that is younger than you must not see him as your junior brother. <laughs> you must be able to, you must deal with yourself and know I can still see him and submit to him as my husband and submit to him. I will not be talking to him as if he say. He says, my junior brother. And anytime you are talking to the church, you say, how, how old are you? I mean, you have that in mind. <laughs> so it has to do with you, whether you are able to respect him, because one single thing that if, if a man says, you don't love me, what it means is that you don't respect me. So even the Bible, the only one instruction God, command God gives to you concerning your husband is to submit yourself to your own husband. It's the key. But as one single instruction to a man concerning the wife is love your wife. So, 
That is the, I think that's, I've answered your question. Just to add to what I said, this, this question can also relate to situations where maybe the wife is earning way more than or she's an executive and the husband is, is below. Um, it comes back to the same thing. You need to be able to come to that point of knowing that this is how, this is the structure God has put um, in, the, in the marital institution that a wife is to submit to her own husband. And are you able to do that? I mean, there are issues we deal with. We're dealing with issues where because the wife is probably um, a higher executive person earning way more, there are issues because um, I, I, I've come to realize that in situations like that, probably that wife needs more submission than, than ordinary to prove to the husband that, yes, you are still uh, the head of this house. The next question says, um, everyone talks about finding your purpose whilst you're single. How do you practically go about that? I think for me, um, let, me let me say this. Did I know I was going to be a pastor when I was marrying my wife in 1985? Maybe, maybe not. Even though as a little kid, you know, maybe five, six years, I was in the in the Seventh Day Seventh Day Adventist Mission Hospital in a town called Inisha. So when I was sick, my mom would carry me there. And one day we each time we go, the doctors and the nurses, doctors will wear white coats. The nurses White, nightingale, smart. All of us we sit and drag with the patients. And then before you go into the clinics or into anything, and we have we do service, you know, 30 minutes, a preach. I told myself from that moment, when I grow up, I will be a pastor and a doctor. But I forgot about it. So many other times you you know your purpose. Why we that it has come, and that's what I, who I am now. By the time I was marrying my wife, I've forgotten about that. That I was, but, but the key thing is to get close to God. Be intimate with God. That is the key issue. That God, you may not have a, a, the full picture of what your life is all about, but progressively God will make you know. So my issue is that be totally sold out to God. Be ready to give God your time. That is what is important. I was listening to um, to um, Otabil, Mensa Otabil, speak in New World some time ago. He said when he was in the university, like we have now, all his friends, people would come to them and say, oh, you are going to be this, you are going to be that. Nobody ever told him what he was going to be. I didn't know he was going to be a pastor. And it's one of the the best pastors the whole world has ever produced. He did something he never knew. So it's not a crime, but the key thing is he must be close to God. Seek his mind. God may tell you a bit of what, what is important for you to know. All right? And that is enough. Praise God. Um, the next question says, is it wrong that I don't want to marry someone who isn't a virgin? Because I am a virgin. Uh, answer is that it's not. It's not wrong. Praise God. So, like Mommy said. Uh, the standard of God, the standard of God is that we shouldn't have sex before marriage, okay? But some people have, ha have done it. Some people have made mistakes. God is a merciful God. So the fact that the spouse that you have has had sex does not mean that that's it for them, okay? 
you've made other mistakes as well, although you're not telling the truth. We know you've, you, <laughs> yeah. We know you've masturbated before, you know. So, um, people who have, who are having sex before marriage, if you're here, you should stop it. Some of you may need to seek for counsel, for prayers, because sometimes the problem with sex is when, once you've started it, it's difficult to stop. And you try and try, you get you know, sad after you've done it, but if you don't seek help, um, you may find it difficult to break. So if, 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 if God has sincerely told you that this is a man, this is a woman you are to marry, and you've, you may, what even if she's had a child before? That, that is also possible. She may have been pregnant before, but that's all in the past. Paul said, let's forget the past and let us press on to the future. Okay, so if we have dealt with that, we've asked God for forgiveness, we've repented. Repentance means we are sorry about what we've done and we've turned away. It's not just enough to be sorry, but you've turned away with the help of the Holy Spirit and you're not going back to that. You're not doing that again. So it is not wrong to marry somebody who is not a virgin as long as, obviously, they are not living in sin anymore. And it's good to be open in relationship before you get married. It's good to be open with one another to say, yeah, I made this mistake in the past. Because it's not good for you to then find out that <laughs> after you get married. So let me give you an example. OK, we're on air, aren't we? OK, I'll try and, I'll try and say it in a way that you can't add it. So some people, it's when they die. And they are doing the funeral program that some names will appear. And they found out that they had a child, you know, sometimes. And even the wife didn't know about it. That's deception. And God is not a God of deception. So in, in marriage, we're open that, yes, I made a mistake. I used to gamble. So let's not even talk about sex. I used to gamble. And I lost a lot of money. I had that addiction. We talked about addiction, didn't we? I had that addiction before, but God has delivered me. I'm not doing that anymore. These are the boundaries that I've put into my life with the help of the Holy. These are the mentors that I have. We talked about mentors. These are the mentors that are helping me to do that. The only thing is that if you're in relation with somebody who's had sex before, you need to be very careful about the boundaries. You need to make sure you put those boundaries. And women, you are, mommy will talk about, mommy has talked about it before. Women, you are in the driving seat. You must be in the driving seat. Especially if it's a man. If it's a man that has had sexual relationships before and has, you know, turned away, the temptations will, will come in your marriage. So women, you have to be in the driving seat and put boundaries. I'll give you an, so my wife, when we were courting, she was very strict too, very strict because I had a lot of testosterone. You know what testosterone is? Yeah. Women have testosterone too, but not as high as men. And for some reason, when we are 20, in our 20s, because, um, so when you are in your, in your teens, because you want to develop sexual characteristics, your body produces a lot of testosterone. In fact, research tells us that your body produces more testosterone than you need. So you have excess and you have reserve. And if you, don't use the Holy, if you don't use the Holy Spirit to help you manage them, are you with me? Now that we are getting less young, my, so my testosterone levels are normal, but they are not as good quality as when I was 25 or 30. Are you understanding me? So if a man has had sex before and has repented and has not, is not having it, and you are in a relationship to get married, as a woman, you must be in the driving seat and say, 10 o'clock, go to your house. Don't, don't, don't sleep in my house. Is that OK? Don't sleep in my house. Because when men have anointing, testosterone overrides the anointing. Are you with me? So you put those boundaries into place. You say, there are certain parts of my body you are not allowed to touch. Please. You can kiss me on the lips. 
No, sir, you can, you can kiss me on the cheeks, but not on the lips. We can hug, you can hold me, but after one minute, you let go. Don't, <laughs> don't hold, you know, you put those boundaries in place. I'm sure I'm... Praise God. All right, um, the next question. Um, From what Pastor Fumi has talked of, singular most important factor in determining you marry is God leading you. Is God leading you. So if God has led me to for me, she wasn't a pastor then. Would I say, have you asked this before? Is that the first question I'm going to ask? No. No, I won't do that. So how do you come about knowing whether it's because you don't rely on that to be to be the determinant of who you marry. In fact, one, once you have say, are you giving that to Jesus Christ? The Bible says if a man is in Christ, is a new creature. All things are passed away. The thing you are judging is the efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ. When you are seeing somebody who has had sex before, you still see him in the light of his past. Mm. Then it's the efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ you are questioning. Mm. It is the, the power of Christ to change that person that you are questioning. It's no more that person. So when you, when you go to somebody, you go to him or her, or it's a man that goes to the woman, because God has come, you think God has come, convinced you, spoken to you, she is the person for you. And I beg you, the first question you ask is not, have you had sex before? Is that okay? Forget about that first. When, when she has responded to you and she said, yes, I've also prayed, you are the person. In the course of your, your courtship, all right, then you can all those attempts you spoke to one, you discuss or your past. But that shouldn't push, push you off. Praise the Lord. Um, I'm going to ask these two questions together. Um, the first one says, I know I shouldn't have sex before marriage, but how does God feel about sexual activities other than sex? i.e. oral sex. Um, and the other question has to do with sex. Just give me a minute. It says, what is the importance of waiting until marriage to have sex? Pastor Joe speaks. Now, mouth, when God made our parts, very specific. Amen? Amen? What you use hands for? Now, when you are writing your exams, do you, do you have some food to write the exam for you? You don't use your hand to walk to your exam room and use your foot or feet to write the exams. You use your hands to write your exam, your feet to carry it to the exam. So you don't, that's what makes you you use of it to walk here. The day we see you walk with your head, we see something is wrong. So mouth is not for sex. <laughs> Alright? And when you may tell oh, pastor is a cake and all that. Bible, your mouth is not for sex. And I will tell you as a doctor, there are a lot of people who have begin to have you know, fungal infection, heart, peace, in their throat, in their mouth, because of this. That's not naturally, that path, that mouth and the, the mucosa, the line is not, it's not, it's not meant for that. Mm. All right? So I'm also talking from this. You know, we don't, we, we talk, just like the, Enos is not is not meant for man for sex. The same way. Sorry, when you are here, we tell you the truth. All right, we don't over spiritualize things. We say the way it is. Hello, amen. So, I said to you, how did you come here today? If I see you walk on your head, I would think so. I said this is not a normal human being. 
If I see you walk on your feet or your hands, I won't look. I, I run away from you. <laughs> they're not natural. They're not meant for that. Praise God. So when we turn the use of what is something to what is not its original intent, then we are abusing it. And there are consequences for it. So I, I will just talk about that. Others will contribute to it. Number two, some people have the opinion when you are married, you can do anything you like. I leave that to you. All right? If you both did, as husband and wife to be doing oral sex, that is up to you. But I'm just giving you a perspective. All right? Now, when it comes to sex before marriage, apart from the fact that God says no. No. You can't continue in it and still be able to please God. When you're not married, what type of questions do you have? You want to please God. So that's the number one thing I wanted to know. The overriding issue is, is God pleased with me? Until you marry, even if you are courting, you are saying you are going to marry each other, you are not married yet. Don't be deceived. You are not married yet. And in the face of God, it's a sin. Number two, that person may even say, I'm not going to marry you again for any reason. And men are very, very, unfortunately, I, sorry, I'm, I'm talking as a doctor now. In today's age, it's been proven that women, even, they are more eager about sex than men. So, go and read it. Go and read it. I think I don't know how that has come. For some of you are told about that. But today's this age, Western ladies, they are more even a guy, but let's have sex more than a man. So, men, so, but let's stop on that. But also, statistics have shown that trust, trust is lost. When you already are sleeping with each other before you marry, when you marry, the trust between, all right, for instance, my wife has never met any man before we marry, we know both of our virgin. I can never suspect her, or her. if she says it's anywhere else, I can never, because when, even when she was single, she never allowed me to touch her. But I didn't allow her to touch me. So I she didn't be suspecting me now because I went to a conference and I'm spending two, three days there. So research has shown that trust, that's the problem of trust in people that have already been having sex before marriage. Let me not go into the issue of you may use you may use protection. Eh? You can use you know contraceptives and things like that, but sexually transmitted diseases they are still you know they are still very prevalent in whatever this. So we want to the key thing is the variety issues. God does not want us to have sex. If you want to be a child of God. You want to please God. Don't you? And you have to know your own boundary. Even Pastor, when you are talking about chick, if you know chick. How much is too much? It's something to arouse that you are wetting yourself. You already gone too much. Am I speaking to you? Yeah. yeah. Either a man or a woman, you are ready. Even if you hold the hand of your, your, your person you are going to marry and you're old, you are wet, then you have gone too much. I've gone too much. So you need to you know yourself. Man, we are here not to deceive ourselves. There's no point for me to deceive you. I'm trying to tell you the, what it is. You can make a choice of what you do. So, forget about anybody giving you rule. You should know yourself. When somebody, don't put yourself in a tempting situation. And together, watching film from, one, from 7 a.m., 2 a.m., you are together. What else do you expect? What else do you expect? You put yourself in a tempting situation. You need to be strict about it. You need to know what you want. And once you do it, you know, you... you now, for instance, me and my wife, we know we're going to be sitting before you now. If we have been having sex in the four years or five years that we caught, do you think I will be confident to be talking to you now? No, my cousin will be picking me and say, ah, why, why are you telling them? Tell them what you did. Tell them you used to sleep with. And the enemy, the devil will be troubling me, tormenting me. So you have to save yourself a whole world of condemnation and judgment from the devil. Please stay away from me. It's a temporary Everybody's time, yes, and God bless you. Yeah, I mean
just, I just wanted to, I mean, I think the uh, senior pastor has actually um, um, hit on some of the areas I, I initially wanted to talk about, um, some of the areas of, of trust. I mean, we've, we've dealt with issues that you, you, you find it difficult to understand why they're having issues until you find out that it comes from uh, before they got married. This is what they were doing. And that has run through the relationship till they've been married for years, and yet they can't trust themselves. And the second thing that, I, again, Pastor uh, Zika has mentioned it, but let me just uh, um, add to it that the Bible says, flee from all appearances of evil. You want to please God, you don't put yourself in a situation that can lead you on. There are things that you do that have the power. God has wired us. And like we are all saying, if, you, if your goal is to please God, you put boundaries in place to never allow that to happen. You know, um, like, like Pastor Zeke said, I, we courted for four years, and yet we can sit here today and say, thank God, we never had sex before that time. And we were close because we put things in place right from the onset. And uh, again, I know myself, if there are, I always used to say to myself that, look, I could, I could visit a pastor or somebody who is senior to me in ministry. They may be watching movies and things and the kind of movies they're watching, they're fine with it. If it's not helping me, I know that it's not gonna help me. They have, maybe they have their wives, if they are aroused, they know where to go, and I don't know where, I don't have anywhere to go. And for that reason, I set the boundaries for myself. And the underlying, underlying principle is that I want to please God. I want this thing to honor God. And once that was the principle, it guided the decisions we made, how close we could get, or what we could do, and all that. And I think uh, that is the most important. If you don't set that limit, and you let things lose, you can be driven in a situation where you, you'll be sorry that you went into that situation. Yeah, this is a very serious matter. Everybody says serious matter. Serious matter. It's very serious and senior pastor was on point, including Pastor Joe. But let me, I want you to listen to me very carefully. On this stage, you have people who have been married for over 20 years. Okay, so I've been married for, in fact, I forgot when we had the couples forum, and they said people who have been married for 20 years, you know, speak. I thought, no, that can't be me, I'm, I'm not that old, you know. And then somebody nudged me behind and said, yeah, your daughter is 21, so you've been, <laughs> <laughs> at least, <laughs> Use that to remember how long you've been married. So on this stage, and these are my seniors. Somebody say seniors. seniors. So I'm still learning from them. Praise God. So three things I want you to remember. Number one is fornication. Somebody say fornication. Fornication is a sin where a man and a woman, or a man and a man, or a woman and a man, have sexual relationship when they are not married. Do you get that? And the Bible says fornication is a sin. Okay? Do we all agree on that? Yes. Number two is adultery. Adultery is sexual relationship between a man or a woman, or a man and a man, or a woman, whatever, <laughs> who are married, or one of them is married, or the other person. I'm a married man now. If I have a sexual relationship with somebody who is not my wife, that is adultery. Do you get it? And the Bible says that is sin. Number three, there's something the Bible calls sexual immorality. Somebody say sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Now, in that sexual immorality, any sexual relationship that God did not ordain or God did not put his rubber stamp is a sin. Whether outside of marriage or inside of marriage. Now, if you read Romans chapter 1, the Bible said that people, because of lust, because of some self-desires, 
have engaged in several activities that God was very upset with them. And so God, from their reprobate mind, God was angry with them and put them aside. Okay, so let me give you a list of sexual immorality. Masturbation is one of them. And masturbation happens in a man and in a woman, even inside of marriage. That God did not, you know why? Your body is a temple of God. So you have no right to abuse your body because your body carries your soul and carries your spirit. Now, if you're a born again Christian, you are carrying God. You need a body to carry God. That's why animals are not born again. Yeah? Animals, you won't see animals in heaven. You won't see a cow in heaven. Because a cow does not carry the spirit. So a cow can do whatever it likes with it. That's what the Bible says. Your body is a temple of the living God. And therefore, you must be careful not to defile your body. All right? With sexual immorality. So you cannot, you, you cannot take your sexual organ and begin to play with it anyhow you like. And the reason you are doing that is because you feel that having sex is a sin over just playing with your sexual organ. But in the sight of God, you are abusing your body. You are defiling the temple of God that carries the Holy Spirit. Do you get it? So if you masturbate, it's sexual immorality. Forget about what is plausible. It is plausible in today's world that masturbation is okay. It's plausible. You know what is plausible? What is plausible is not necessarily truth. The Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So because some of the doctors will say, okay, it's all right. We'll when you come to see us, they say, um, because I masturbate a lot, my private part is very sore. We give them medication to treat them. Because it's medical, it's plausible. Because it's plausible does not mean it is truth. Are you getting that? It is also plausible, it is also acceptable in today's world that a man and a woman who are not married can have sex. In fact, the government approves it. Okay? What the government approves, in fact, government approves that a man and a man can have a relationship. Do you know that? Government approves, the society approves that a man and a man can have, relate together but God does not approve it. So you've got to make up your mind, where do you stand? Moses sir, spoke to the children of Israel and said, you, choose you this day who you want to serve. Do you want to be politically correct? Do you want to be on the side of the government? Do you want to be on the side of the society? Do you want to be on the side of your peers? Or do you want to be on the side of God? So you choose. If you want to be on the side of God, then your body, which carries your soul, right? Which carries your spirit, must be kept undefiled. Don't touch your private part anyhow. Don't let anybody touch your private part anyhow. By the way, why are you thinking about oral sex? You are not married. Why should you be thinking about sex? By the, I, just, I just thought I would ask. Because, listen... The fact that you are thinking about it tells me that there's a deeper problem that you've not dealt with. And until you deal... So the, the, the solution to your problem is not, why can't I have oral sex? The solution to your problem is that we need to deal with the deeper issue why you are lost in. Eh? I told you... No, maybe not your group. I'm a cosmetic surgeon. Okay? And I used to do a clinic somewhere. I will not tell you. And because they display the breast implants that I use, in that clinic, there is a big portrait of a naked woman who's had the kind of surgery that I do to show when the patient's coming. This is what you look, you know. And every time I come to the clinic, as I sit down like this, that's what I see. Ah, I say, Pastor, this is a problem for me. Oh. Are you with me? Boundaries, remember. So, 
Next time, I told them, I said, I don't want to consult in that room again. I said, I don't want that room again. Just put me in the name. It's not as comfortable because every time I come and I see that woman, when I go home, that's the woman I've been thinking about. So it's creating a problem for me, even though it's related to my job. So, I, so do you understand? So that person has a deeper problem that needs to be there. When I was growing up, my father had seven wives. How many? Seven. Somebody say seven. seven. So I told myself, God, this is a problem for me. These traits that I've inherited from my father, I must deal with it to make sure that it doesn't cause problem for me. Is that okay? So what is my advice to you? You need to seek help. Look at your neighbor. Say, look, look at your neighbor now. Say, seek help. Okay? Seek help. Do you know some people... Under, let me finish. Under sexual immorality is pornography. So even oral sex, um, masturbation, pornography, right? Anal sex, and then some of you. Now, can I be real? Can I be real? Look at your neighbor now. Say he wants to be real now. Yeah, some of you have been deceived. You don't do masturbation, you don't do oral sex, you don't do pornography, but you watch certain films, and they are doing stuff. And you'll be saying, why are they showing this? They don't need to be shown. <laughs> why are they? Do you understand? Yeah, but you're still watching. You're saying, why are they showing this? Can I tell you, every time you are watching people doing things that you're not supposed to be watching, you are sowing a seed into your soul. And that seed is germinating, it's building up, and it's affecting your testosterone. You know, I told you women have testosterone too. It is affecting your libido. The problem why you're thinking about sex before marriage is because your libido is at the wrong level. And your libido is being fed by the things you've touched, the things that you've seen. And they warned you before the start of the film. This film has a lot of sexual content and adult things. That's why they warn you. It is by law. They have to warn you. So me, that I'm married, and my wife, we've decided that there are certain... When we start it, and they say, this film has... We, we delete it. Go to the next one. So that's why me, I just watch comedies. I don't, so make sure that you cut off the things that are feeding your libido... That is making you feel that you have to have it. Look, when you get married, you have opportunity for plenty of it. You can have it every day, if you like. But you have to go to work. <laughs> I'm not going to talk for long. I just want to read a scripture. And I'm reading Romans 128 in Passion Translation. Passion Translation, Romans 1.28. Write it down and read it when you get home. He said, and because they thought it was worthless to embrace the true knowledge of God, God gave them over to a worthless mindset to break all rules of proper conduct. This is what is happening in the world today. People do anything and anything and everything. And they talk about it. You see a lot of video uh, couples doing video things now, and they talk about all manners of things. They, they are Christians. Some of them are Christians. And because you watch them, you think what they're saying is correct. God has given some people over to a reprobate mind. That's what the King James Version call it. He said, this one says, to a worthless mindset to break all rules of proper conduct. There is a way God wants you to live. And it is important you embrace the true knowledge of God. When you are able to do that, you will live pleasing God. Praise God. I'm going to take two more questions um, because of time. Um, I'm going to ask Mommy P this question directly, and I'm going to join two questions together. Um, and the first one says, should a woman start submitting to a man in their relationship before marriage. 
the second question says, if a woman is interested in a good man, what is wrong with her pursuing him in a respectful and matured way? Should we always wait for the man to pursue us? You need to, you need to wait for the man to pursue you. Because the Bible says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing. Not she that finds a husband. Okay? He that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Now, it's, okay, it's possible for you to know well ahead of time who your husband is as a woman. Maybe because you have this fine relationship with God and God shows you or tells you this is the person. The only thing you can do, the only matured way to go about it is keep praying for him. Bind the bindables, lose the losable. If he's not seeing you, unveil his face. He'll begin to see you. Don't go and be cooking for him. Don't go and be greeting him every meeting you want to sit next to him. No. Don't let him pursue you. Let him woo you. That's your worth as a woman. And that's the way the Bible wants it to be. Look at every example you find in the Bible. Is the man chasing after the woman. When you have given yourself as cheap, he will, 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 will maltreat you and say all manners of things against you. Most of the time, we go ahead to try our own ways because we are not ready to wait for the Lord. We want to work it out. You don't need to help God. It's God by himself. And he has a way of working things out for you. So wait for his time. He will work it out. And what's the second one? Um, Should you submit to a man in the relationship that you're not married to yet? If you, have, if you are in a courtship relationship, you know that we are in courtship. We have prayed. And this is the problem I have with you are in relationship because... For 10 years, you are waiting to get a ring. Once you have prayed, and that is the way it is, you have prayed and know that this is the man for me, and you have given a yes. You are in courtship. And so at that time, it's not the time to just be messing around, to just be going for films here and there. This is the time to invest in that relationship. Read about marriage. Discuss issues. What do you think about tithes and offering? What do you think about this? Wearing earrings or using wigs or things like that. These are the basic things. These are the times you visit families. These are the times you talk about parenting. Okay, I, 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 what is your parents' parenting skills like? How, how were you brought up? This is the time to do certain things. So in courtship, it's possible for you to be planning things. Maybe you want to uh, buy a house together. There must be a leader in that relationship. And that's what submission is all about. Okay, I have my own power. I have money. But because my husband is my head, God wants me to submit to him. But if it is just a relationship you are trying out, you are not sure, don't let any man put you under control. But once you are sure this is the man for me and you are heading for marriage, there will be times there will be disagreements about issues. So somebody must come up as the head and say, okay, this is the way I think we should go. And you submit to that. That is what submission is all about. But let's say you are going out with somebody, you know it's the will of God. You want to go and visit your prayer and say, don't go. Don't go. I, I want to do this, don't do this. You know, I mean, that's not, that's not, that's control. The other extreme is you always argue with each other. That's the, that's the bad sign. So you need to be able to learn to, to listen. Because these are the things you are trying to see and can. If both of you say, oh, we are going this way, and you discuss, you give your reasons, and the man says, anyway, let's go this way. You discuss it. Yeah, you submit. That's submission. But not that I want to go to fellowship. Must you go today? But the Bible says, I should come for, for this. Must you go? Don't go. You know, that's, that's control, and you need to watch that. The real submission is actually when you get married. You need to make up your mind about it. 
Rafi, but before then, you want to go for lectures. You say, ah, that lecture, you can't miss it now. <laughs> I, I just want you to go. It doesn't say any reason why. You want to try a business, you don't try. I mean, those are things that's not. So, submission is not just somebody put his feet down without reason. You talk together, and if for any reason you're giving reason and all that, and somebody says, let us do this way, then you defer to him. All right? So, I hope you have. So, don't. Don't take it that now everything he says, I must do it. You are not married yet. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm confusing you. <laughs> Amen. So it's a bad sign. It's a bad woman when it's already started controlling you now. You, you don't have, you could do meditation on your own, except he said, give you approval. Until you marry, that's, that's when you marry, that's what operates. But in the way you can practice in it. But that's to be something you discuss about, and then you don't. Which what will you do? You know, you've discussed together, and you can defer to him with wisdom and all that. That's the way I think it should be. All right. We've introduced that book to them. Yeah, I was going to recommend that everybody should. Let me just introduce it. This have you all seen this book by the senior pastor? It's called The Matchmaker at Your Service. I'm sure we'll have enough copies for all of you to read. As I said to you, this, this is written from the Bible standard and also written from, a, from experience of senior pastor, I'm a pastor, mentoring. So they, they are, my wife and I, we are mentored by them, okay? And like mommy was saying to you, if I do something to my wife and my wife calls them and they call me, that's it. Do you understand? So, Everybody here, you are serious about what we're talking about, you should buy this book. In this book, Senior Pastor talks about red flags. Okay? You know what red flags are? Yeah, I'll let him talk about it uh, in a minute. Next year, another book on young people of marriage will come out, all right? Second one, all right. So. Ladies, where God has told you that a man is your man and you're struggling, you, you really want to go and tell them, you've got to trust God, okay? In all our dealings with God, we trust God. Let me give you the worst scenario. The worst scenario is that God, I'm a lady and God tells me that Okwe is my man and Okwe is not moving a, making any move, right? God says that he will work all things together for my good, Okay, God will not allow Okwe's mistake to ruin my destiny, because God has answers for God has answers for everything, as long as we follow His principles. That's why God is a God of principle. So don't be afraid that um, if you don't go and approach the man, you will miss the man. Even if you miss the man, God will provide another man. And a lot of times, it may not be right. Maybe you are, you have not gotten it right. Maybe because there was a time I thought a woman was my, my wife. I was so sure that God said it. And I was, but I was wrong until I met my wife. And I knew, oh, this is the real one. That one was a shadow. <laughs> Do you understand? So God will sort you out. Don't worry. Don't be, don't be anxious. Don't because of anxiety then want to break the rule of God. Because God is a good God. Look at your neighbor and say, God is a good God. He says, for I know the thoughts that I have to, is that Jeremiah 11, 29, is it? I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Yeah, 29, 11. To give you a hope and a future. Praise God. Um, there was a time I had, I felt a particular man in fellowship is my husband. And it was so real to me. And then I started praying for him. When I prayed for him, God will answer. You know, anything I asked God concerning him, God was answering. And it went on for years. So that, you know, when all the people were coming, I would just say, no, you're not the one. I know the one. So at the last time when my husband came, at that point I was praying and I was saying, God, and there were a few things that God has shown me or told me along the line that pointed to him. And I said, God, you know, why we, why, I, I, I thought that was the man. And I've been praying for him. You've been answering. God said, I put him there 
so that your heart can be kept away from the real one. I had 14 men saying it was the will of God. And at the beginning, <laughs> at, at, at the beginning, at the beginning, I was, I was just finishing secondary school when a man of God, Brogbile Akoni, said to me that God said he should speak to me about marriage. I said, I'm a small girl. Oh. I'm going to university and I want to study medicine. I don't need anything about it. I'm not even ready now. And he said, God said I should talk to you about it. And then we sat down. He spoke. He said a lot of things. And at the end of the day, two weeks after that, one brother came and said, I've been praying and God said you are the one. So me, I just said, okay, let me pray about it. I prayed about it. God told me that when it is time, I will let you know. So anybody that comes after that, I said, no, you're not the one because God said to me, when it is time, he will let me know. And then all those first seven people, I dispersed them. We were still friends in fellowship. They will come to my room, I'll cook for them. That's why you should be friends to one another. If somebody, you want him to come to you and he has not come to you, don't fight them. Be friends. They, they are your friends. They are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Some people, because you want somebody to marry, you are, you are not talking to them again. No, it doesn't work like that. And now, when this last batch came, and... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> so, you are wasting time. I have to go. Somebody, I now said to God, I said, God, I... Everything you have been telling me is pointing to this man. But why is it that this one was there? God said to me, I put him there to guard your heart against the distraction from all the other people. And throughout that period, that man never come to me to say for me, you are the one for me. And God said to me, this, this man is in relationship. It was so bad that my friend went to his room to check him out, whether he's in relationship. And those days, when you are in relationship with somebody, your album, your room, you have his picture everywhere. Nothing was showing for this girl. In the, God said, this man is in relationship. This is where the, man, the girl lives. This is what her name is. This is the, course, uh, the job she's doing. And it was a few weeks after God spoke to me, a friend of mine was going to the north. And this brother sent, sent her to that lady. Immediately she got to the house, this brother's picture was everywhere. In fact, they were planning marriage. You can see foolishness now. So sometimes you get it wrong. And that's why you don't have the audacity to go and meet a man and say, oh, I've been praying, I've been fasting, you are the man for me. Wait for God to sort it out. If you are correct, that man will come. And you don't want to feature anything that's there, anything you are talking about, the man saying, you are the one running after me. You are the one. You know, you understand. You all through your life, the man telling you, please, I wasn't king. You are the one that, that come and impose yourself on me. And you don't want to live your life all through that. All right, yes. All right, let's put together for our speakers. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's where we're gonna end it because of time. Um, we might be able to take a few questions during the last session, okay? Um, but what we're going to do now is the matchmaker at your service, a senior pastor's book, is on sales for five pounds. You can get one at the back. If you, if, you have, if you haven't got cash, you can pay with your card. Yeah, you can pay with your card, okay? And if you like pastor or pastor for me to sign the book for you, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to do that for you, okay? So very quickly, we have an international guest who's going to be speaking to us next. We're going to take a five minutes break, all right? So quickly, you know, you know, stretch your legs, you know, go to the bathroom, and then we're going to start at, we're going to resume back by quarter past two, just five minutes. Thank you very much. Don't you feel, don't you 
you worry Don't be dismayed For I am with you So I will rest in my thoughts, promise Cause he's gonna help me through Help me through Many times, try to go my own way Try to do it by myself Didn't need nobody else here But I was lost in the dark Couldn't find that one bright light Cause Lord knows I was lonely and confused So I rose up, I shone for my strength from within My once cloud and dark thought flooded with my feet So I thought of that still was coming from so deep So I ran up, but you know what? My heart told me, daughter, don't you fear Don't you worry, be just way For I am with you, so I will rest in my thoughts Too deep. Why can't I find some peace? Why? Breaking down, cause I shone. I want a lonely source. I'm surprised, cause I'm so lonely and confused. Lonely and confused. Yeah. So I ran up, but you know what? My heart told me, daughter, don't you fear? Don't you fear? Don't you worry? We just beg you. I'm with you, so I will rest in my father's promise. He's gonna help me through, help me through. Yeah, he's gonna help me through, help me through. Who am I to question you, or oh, doubt the things you do, oh God? How could I understand your ways, or quantify your grace, oh God? How could I figure out your plans, when time is in your hands? You're the master of everything, how could I question you? Yeah. How could I question you? Through it all you're still God, through it all you're still keeping me. Through it all, you're still God And you hold me in the palm of your hands How could I question you? You are 